the chair of the programs committee um, to, uh, to welcome you to today's uh, event. Um, some of the Foreign Trade Association in the next uh, few weeks and months is going to be having, um, actually on uh, August 25th, a event on foreign trade zones, uh, an overview of the FTZ program and, um, uh, and how the Port of Long Beach is sponsoring that. I'm sure Bruce will be talking about some of that today. Um, but we have other programs in the works for later in September and October, and we're working on a, a mixer event where we'll all go to the same physical place, have some appetizers and a drink, and get a chance to crawl out from whatever rock we've been hiding under for the past year and a half so that we can network and uh, meet with each other. And we're also planning a holiday uh, party for December. So if you find any interest in these topics and you aren't already a member of the Foreign Trade Association, we invite you to consider joining our, uh, our group um, and uh, be happy to have you. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, first, to let you know that we've got all attendees um, currently in listen-only mode, and we'd ask that you uh, continue to keep your cameras off. We have a, a relatively small group here <clears throat> today so that if you do have a question, just unmute your microphone and uh, your instructor will be happy to address it. Um, we also have FTA staff who will be monitoring the chat box if you have any technical issues. Um, today and tomorrow's presentation are sponsored by Brolmeyer Law Group, um, founded by Adrienne Brolmeyer uh, with offices throughout the US, Mexico. Um, it has experts in uh, import, export, drawback, foreign trade zones, Mexican trade law, uh, USMCA, and almost every other aspect of international trade. In the past, this class has been a, a two-day, eight-hour, each day, face-to-face -face event on the campus at American Honda in Torrance. We skipped uh, last year, but due to the request to bring it back, we've condensed it into a two-day, four-hour-per-day virtual event. Uh, no one, especially in the instructor, wants to Zoom for two days straight. Um, thus, we have this condensed version that we'll be presenting over the next two days. We have the honor and the privilege of hearing from Mr. Bruce Leeds. Prior to being an attorney, Bruce was an import specialist at U.S. Customs in Los Angeles for seven years, then joined Hughes Aircraft Company, where he supervised a team of 27 employees, managing the import and export documentation, compliance, and licensing functions, and, and establishing policies and procedures, conducting compliance investigations, assisting in um, subsidiaries in several states with import-export issues. He later joined Hughes Space and Communications Company and the Boeing Company and uh, serving as import-export compliance positions. He's also a U.S. Army veteran. Bruce has held a number of prestigious leadership positions over the years and continues to do so. He's a board member and a past president of the Foreign Trade Association, as well as a chair of the Women International Trade Board of Governors for AAEI and a, um, a member of the International Compliance Professionals Association and the Society of International Affairs. With an undergrad from Cal State LA and a JD from the University of the West Los Angeles School of Law, he's also a certified customs specialist and a licensed customs broker. In fact, Bruce was my instructor for my CHB test preparation class back when you had to pay duties in gold. So uh, if you have not previously had the privilege to hear Bruce speak, you're in for a real treat. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Mark. Now I can I need to live up to that introduction. Okay, and welcome to the class. Um, kind of like the schedule today. It's going to be nine to noon Pacific time, or adjust that for your time zone. Well, we get a break. No, you don't get any breaks in this class. No, I'm just teasing you. Uh, about halfway through, we will take a appropriate break, and we're going to do half of it today, and the second half will be tomorrow, and. Just a little bit of background on this class. Uh, Mark covered that in the past has been a face-to-face -face class and, and events willing and health willing and all that kind of stuff. Maybe we'll be able to go back to that. Uh, but in the meantime, we're gonna do it virtual and see how this goes. Okay, and a little bit of uh, just background on it. In when I worked for Hughes and I worked for Boeing, 
um, worked, I worked in import compliance for the most part. I also did export compliance, but um, in that job, I had to do things like uh, select customs brokers, deal with powers attorneys, customs buns, respond to customs requests on form 28s and 29s, and uh, manage a drawback program and a TIB program and all these other things. So I've had a lot of hands-on experience with import compliance. And so it was, gee whiz, uh, goes back up, I'm looking at it right now, almost 20 years ago, I said, well, why don't I take all this experience that I've had and do a class based on that? And that's where this class started. And so today you're gonna be doing the virtual version of this class. And along the way, if you have questions that you wanna ask, um, I think working with Anna, we can respond to your questions. Let us know if you've got questions and we'll respond to them. In the meantime, let me go ahead and get started. And uh, here we go. All right, here's some stuff that we're gonna be covering, not just today, but tomorrow. Introduction to customs and border protect protection. A lot of people say border patrol, but it's border protection. Um, and along in there is some definitions. We talk about the customs entry process and the clearance process, been a lot of changes in that in recent times. Uh, various customs programs that maybe you part, your company participates in, or maybe you're thinking about having your company participate in. Um, tariff classification, duties, fees, 301 duties, and all that other great stuff, valuation. We'll probably get started on classification today, and uh, then uh, finish up on that tomorrow. And when I say other custom stuff, that's different uh, programs. It could be bond, using bond warehouses, foreign trade zones, all that great stuff. And then we'll move over to the dark side and talk about uh, enforcement and penalties and what you can do if you disagree with customs and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there's the agenda for today and tomorrow. So let's get started on today. Uh, different agencies, if you're, if you're an importer, you probably know that you don't only deal with customs and border protection. There are other agencies out there that you may have to deal with uh, from time to time or depending on the commodity or the situation, et cetera. And then we'll take a look at some materials and websites and regulations. That sounds pretty boring. No, this is resource stuff. It, it may be boring, but it's important boring stuff. Um, where do you get information to do the job? And some unique definitions. So every trade, I also teach export compliance and it has its own vocabulary and uh, import compliance, it has its vocabulary and some terms that are unique to it. So there we go. All right. Yeah, how do I, I can, hang on, I'm gonna try to get this thing out of the way. There we go, that's better, all right. Customs Border Protection is part of the Department of Homeland Security. It wasn't always that way. For most of its history, since Customs collects cut duties, it was part of the U.S. Treasury Department. Then after 9-11, they created the Department of Homeland Security and put Customs in as part of that agency. Back in the, old, back in the bad old days, there was no income tax. Imagine that, no income tax. That the primary source of revenue for the U.S. government was customs duties. And so that's why it's part of the US Treasury. And um, later on, I guess right now, IRS is the primary revenue agency, but customs still collects, I think it's around $30 billion a year. So not too bad. The commissioner of customs and border protection is appointed by the president with Senate confirmation. That's been that way throughout its history that the president has to nominate a commissioner and then the Senate will hold hearings with that individual and then confirm him or her. And yes, there's been at least one female commissioner in recent years. Right now, there's a gentleman, Chris Magnus. He's the chief of police in Tucson, Arizona. He is the person who's been nominated as commissioner. I don't believe he's been confirmed yet. Uh, the Senate has other priorities right now. And so they haven't got around to confirming him. So right now he's the nominee. and. Uh, probably working in that position. Okay. Customs has officers in ports and border crossings, just about any port or border crossing or airport you can think of that has international traffic going through it um, has CBP officers there. So if you're importing through uh, 
Um, let's see, where where would be a good port of entry? Um, Trying to try and think, North North Dakota, importing through North Dakota. There are customs ports in North Dakota for traffic coming from Canada. Uh, there are, of course, uh, customs ports uh, on the Mexican border. So if you're importing through Eagle Pass, Texas, there is a customs port there. And also, if you go to Canada and then come back from Canada, um, what you might notice is you clear U.S. customs before you get on the airplane at the Canadian airport. I think in the Bahamas and a few other places, it's the same story. There are customs officers stationed outside the United States. There are also customs officers stationed at US, different US embassies and some consulates uh, overseas. And their job is uh, to conduct investigations and work on mutual programs and that kind of thing. Okay. The Border Patrol is also part of Customs Border Protection. Border Patrol has been very much in the news lately and they report to the same commissioner. Okay, the website, CBP website is uh, at cbp.gov. As government websites go, this is a very good website. Um, if you go to CB, cbp.gov, first I recommend if you're working in this field, if you haven't done so already, bookmark that site because it has a lot of great information there. When you go to cbp.gov, the first thing you'll see is uh, information about the commissioner and things they're working on and major programs and that sort of thing. And if they've had major enforcement cases recently, you can read about all that stuff, but there are different tabs on the main page. And the tab that probably will interest you or concern you the most is the tab called trade. And by trade, they mean dealing with importers. At the trade uh, tab, what you're gonna find there is a further menu. And that further menu is gonna have things like forms and publications. It's gonna have like customs broker rules. It's gonna have customs programs on there. It's gonna have enforcement and audits. Those kinds of things you'll find it on the trade page. And a couple of things we'll be talking about in this course today and tomorrow. Um, one of which is, first of all, they list all the outstanding dumping and countervailing duty cases. So if you're wondering, is my thing subject to dumping or countervailing duty? You can kind of do a search there and you can find the dumping case and read all the gory details of what's covered by dumping. And that may be very important to you and your company. And if you're asking the question, what in the heck is dumping? We'll be getting to that probably tomorrow. All right. And if you want to go work for customs, oh, let's, before we leave the trade page, one other thing that's very, very useful there is what's called the cross search engine. And when we cover, cover tariff classification, we'll talk about the cross search engine. And cross search engine, customs issues more written rulings than all other federal agencies put together. And those rulings, the full details of those rulings are found on the cross search engine. So if you're importing in something and you're wondering what's the duty rate on my thing or the tariff classification, you can go look up and see if there's any rulings dealing with that product or something similar to your product. And great resource. And they have probably several tens of thousands of rulings there and you can do searches on that and great source of information. Okay, that's because under careers, if you want to work for customs, you can actually go to their careers page and look up and see what jobs are available. And it could be a nice career for you, okay. Customs administers the Tariff Act of 1930 is amended. That's in Title 19 of the US Code. If you go to Title 19 US Code, just do a Google search, 19 US Code, what you're gonna find there is the Tariff Act of 1930 as amended. That was passed in 1930 in the middle of the depression. In fact, many people say that the Tariff Act of 1930 was one of the causes of the depression um, because of all the special tariffs and restrictions it put in place. As amended, it's been hugely changed over the year. So 19 US code is the basic law that customs administers. A harmonized tariff schedule of the United States. The best place to find that is you can go to the US International Trade Commission site, usitc.gov. That's usitc.gov. 
and there you'll find the harmonized tariff schedule. In fact, what's kind of neat is they also have the Schedule B for exports, and they have previous versions of the harmonized tariff schedule. I think they have like five or seven years of previous versions of the tariff schedule because it does change from year to year. And so you'll find that at usitc.gov and you can bring it up as a PDF document. I would say if you plan to print out the whole darn thing, um, you better let all your colleagues know because it's, it's several thousand pages and it's gonna occupy your printer. If you want a hard copy of the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the US or the Tariff Act 1930 or the Customs Regulations, go to the Government Printing Office, gpo.gov, Government Printing Office, and there you can buy hard copies of these documents. In fact, if any of you are thinking about taking the Customs Brokers examination, um, they still require you, the last I heard, is to have hard copies of these documents and you can't have your computer with you and look them up online. All right, so there's a good source of the harmonized tariff schedule. I recommend the online one because it's the latest, greatest version. I think at cbp.gov, you'll find a link to it. Customs regulations, um, they're found in 19 US CFR. So you can do a Google search, Title 19 CFR, and you'll find the customs regulations there, or you can go to, um, gpo.gov or you can simply do a google search and bring up the and there's a, by the way there's a link to it also at cbp.gov customs regulations those are the detailed regulations which enforce their or administer the basic law so if you want to find out the customs brokers regulations for example you can go to uh, part 111 of the customs regulations and there are all the details and some recent changes to the customs regulations is part 182. Those are the customs regulations dealing with the US, Canada, Mexico free trade agreement. And they are in stages uh, publishing regulations to administer USMCA. And that's where you'll find them. So a uh, couple sources, there's a link at cpp.gov the customs regulations. You can buy a hard copy from gpo.gov. I think you might be able to find a soft copy there as well. Or you can simply do a Google search and look up Title 19 CFR, Code of Federal Regulation, and it'll take you to it. And you can bring it up as a PDF document and do searches and a lot of this stuff. Now, another major role that CBP has is enforcing the laws and regulations of other federal agencies. You want to import food product? Well, that's going to be subject to Food and Drug Administration rules and maybe Department of Agriculture rules. You want to import children's sleepwear? Well, that is subject to the um, Consumer Product Safety Commission. And so there are a whole bunch of different federal agencies for which Customs enforces their regulations. You may hear about something called a single window system or uh, that's, I think, the primary name it's called nowadays. What CBP is working on, and this is not an overnight process, but it's partially in place right now, that CBP is working with other federal agencies so that you only have one place to go to get all the information you need on all these different import rules and regulations, no matter what the agency is. And also, they're working on a single declaration for both import and for export that by filing one declaration, you can clear customs. And if it's subject to food and drug requirements, you can clear food and drug at the same time. So if you hear about a single with window system, uh, that's in the works. Lots of important definitions. And so these are just some of them. And so if you get into this trade, you have a, there's gonna be a unique uh, language that you have to speak and here are some of the terms in that language, and you have to learn these terms to fully understand what NAC are talking about. Okay, entry, that can, that can be, have a couple of different meanings in this context. Entry can be the process of clearing customs. So you go show up at the border and you have your customs broker file the appropriate documentation, whether it's hard copy or soft copy, and it obtains the release of the shipment. Uh, that's the that's an entry. It also refers to the documents or data 
presented to obtain releases of a shipment. Nowadays, this is mostly automated. So usually there's no documents involved except soft, soft copy documents, clear customs. And it could be data that's transmitted at the time the shipment leaves the country of export. There's a certain set of data I believe we'll be talking about in a little while that's sent to customs. And based on that data, customs determine whether or not they want to see the shipment or that whether they'll release it electronically. And when it gets to the US, you simply take, take it and go on your way. So that's the, and the um, documents or data presented to obtain release of a shipment. Yes, I didn't say pay the duty on it. That's going to be a different process and more on that to follow too. Examination, that could be, that can take different forms. Normally, when you think of customs examination, you think of a uniformed customs officer wearing a badge and all that kind of stuff and looking at the things being imported. And they do that. Uh, however, not that much. If you go down to the port of LA Long Beach, you'll see all these freight terminals, you'll see stacks of containers, you'll see, nowadays you see container ships in the harbor and a whole lineup of cargo uh, container ships outside the harbor waiting to come in, waiting for their turn to come in, all loaded with a jillion containers on them. Of all those containers that enter the port of LA Long Beach, how many do you think they physically exam? I mean, it's open up to see what's inside probably less than 1%. So customs examination can take different forms. It could be a physical examination. It can be a, what we call an x-ray examination. Actually, you use a, it's called a Vaxis machine and it uses uh, gamma rays to in effect, take an x-ray image of a shipment. In other cases, examination can simply be looking at the documents, whether they're hard copy or soft copy, and looking at the documents. And based on that, a customs officer can determine whether they need to look at, look further, look at the physically examine the shipment or let it goes on its way. So any one of those things is an examination. In bond, that means moving cargo through the United States without clearing customs. A couple of different forms, let's say a, a Canadian grocery chain wants to import tomatoes and the tomatoes come from Mexico. So they need to move the tomatoes from Mexico to Canada through the United States. That's going to be covered by what's called an in-bond uh, clearance. So it's going to move through the United States under a bond. The bond guarantees that they're not going to divert it or, or sell it or anything like that. And it's going to move through the United States to Canada where it clears customs. It can also mean a shipment. Um, the importer is located in Dallas, Texas. The shipment arrives in Long Beach, California. Well, the importer in Dallas they have two different choices. Choice number one would be to have it cleared customs in Long Beach. Choice number two, maybe they want to, they would rather clear customs in Dallas, Texas. Well, it can be moved in bond from uh, Long Beach, the place of arrival, to Dallas where it actually clears. Customs duties, norm, most customs duties are what they call ad valorem. That's a great Latin expression, meaning percentage. So most duties are a percentage. If you want to impress your, your neighbors or coworkers, you can use the term ad valorem. All right, sounds good. All right. There's also sometimes goods are subject to what's called a specific duty. That could be a dollar a kilo or, or something along those lines. So there's, it's, duty not based on percentage. And by the way, I said a dollar per kilo. The customs harmonized tariff schedule is metric. So if you're not used to ki kilos and, uh, milli and millimeters and all that kind of stuff, the tariff schedule is in metric terms. That's because it's an international document. More on that to follow too. There, another rate of duty is actually free. And there are many, many um, items that can be imported free of duty. Now, there are also special duties and user fees like the China 301 duties, the merchandise processing fee and whatnot. We'll get, we'll, we'll get to those shortly. ACE, automated commercial environment. This is the automated system that customs uses to uh, clear shipments, to determine whether they're gonna examine them or not and do what's called post-entry work. Like maybe they want more information about what's in the shipment. 
uh, not fully implemented. It's still, I would say, maybe 90 to 99% done, but there's still things they're working on. I mentioned the single, the single window system where other agencies also participate in ACE and their requirements are also satisfied through ACE. That's something that's still in process, bringing all those other agencies in. Um, and the ACE system is also used for export. So if you export something and file a export declaration, it's an EEI, it's filed actually in ACE. And um, as an importer, you can subscribe to what's called the ACE portal, which I strongly recommend if you're an importer, sign up for the ACE portal. It's free. Uh, Customs has an 800 number you can call and they'll help you through it, get, a, get onto the system. And once you're in the ACE portal, you're gonna see online all of your imports. And there's a whole bunch of other useful information there too. So good thing. And by the way, it's also available to exporters. So if you're an exporter, you can sign up for the ACE export portal. That's a separate application by the way, but they'll help you with that one too. And it's also free. Bond guarantee, post to custom to guarantee that you're gonna pay duty and all the other fees and whatnot you have to pay and also meet other government requirements. You, maybe you're importing sh frozen shrimp and the Food and Drug Administration wants to take a sample of those frozen shrimp to make sure that they meet food and drug requirements. Uh, what's the guarantee that you're gonna do that? Well, the bond guarantees that too. Or maybe you import something and declare it free of duty. And later on customs decides it's not free of duty. It comes under a different tariff number, it takes a duty. So they wanna send you a bill for that additional duty. What if you don't pay the bill? Bond's gonna guarantee that you do that. PGA has nothing to do with golf. It means participating. The P word can be participating principal or partnering government agency. That could be Food and Drug Administration, Fish and Wildlife, all these other government agencies um, that, whose regulations are enforced by CVP. So hear that acronym PGA, and it means a agency that to one extent or another participates in the import process. Importer record has nothing to do with somebody importing vinyl. It has to do with uh, who is legally responsible for making entry, paying duties and fees and meeting all of the regulatory requirements. There are, is a law dealing with that. And I think we'll be covering that one too. Customs broker, if a importer record can always clear their own shipments, assuming they know how to and they got the right tools to do so, importer record can always clear its own shipment. It doesn't have to have a license or anything like that. Uh, simply an importer record could do that. Most importers outsource that. And if they outsource that customs clearance process, it must be outsourced to a customs broker. Okay. So that's an agent who is legally appointed and more on this one too to make entry and deal with other customs issues associated with importing and filing entry. Power attorney is how you go about appointing a customs broker. By issuing a power attorney, you're making them your legal agent. So let's talk about entries and clearances. Here's some of the topics, subtopics here. Entries, they talk about entries and entry process, bonds and what called EIN numbers. And EIN number could has also has several meanings. We'll talk about that one. Brokers and how to select and appoint a broker and the ACE program and ACE cargo release, which is primarily how entries are done nowadays. Okay, there are three basic ways to clear customs. First of all is what's called an informal entry. The informal entry is just how, the, how it sounds. It could be, it can be done hard copy. Um, you uh, prepare a form and you attach a check for whatever duty or fees you may owe. And they look at it and say, well, that looks good to us and shipments released. That's a simple process. Or it can be done electronically and you file an electronic declaration and you pay uh, duty by, um, either electronic funds transfer, or you can use a check again if you want. Broker can handle that for you. So it's for either commercial shipments. A commercial shipment, by the way, is any shipment having a commercial purpose. It could be something that importer is buying from a foreign supplier. It could be something an importer re receiving from a foreign, potential foreign customer for maybe um, 
examination or a demo. It could be something an importer receives, but something they exported. And there's the uh, Newton's law of export import. That is whatever goes out comes back. Okay, so a company exports something and now they receive it back. Maybe it was a temporary export and that's why it's coming back or maybe it's coming back for repair or replacement. There's still, that's still a commercial purpose why they're importing that thing. It's associated with their business. That is not a, uh, that's still commercial and it only qualifies for informal entry if it's worth less than $2,500 fair market value. However, personal shipments, that's something for your own personal use or maybe gifts for your family or friends, not your business associates, that's starting to look like a commercial shipment. So gifts for your family or friends or for things for your own personal use, there is no limit. $2,500 rule doesn't apply. It could be worth a million dollars, but if it's for own personal use, it is uh, subject to informal entry. My personal experience with that is many years ago, working in the customs mail division, we got a shipment came in by registered airmail. It was a diamond. Um, I forget how many carats it was. It was pretty big address to Elizabeth Taylor and it was worth, I don't know, a million dollars. And uh, so did that qualify for an informal entry? Yeah non-commercial shipments for own personal use. Show it off to her friends, I suppose, and qualified for an informal entry. Formal entry is anything that's not an informal entry. It's commercial shipments over $2,500 in value. There are, customs can in, insist if you're importing something on informal entry uh, under $2,500 or even over $2,500, customs has the right to force that person to file a formal entry if they feel maybe this might be commercial. So they can obligate the, somebody to file a formal entry, but primarily that applies to commercial shipments over $2,500, either purchase price, fair market value. Now, something has been a little bit in the news and a little bit controversial recently, and has had some changes recently. There's, section, there's a section 321 clearance. If you hear the expression section clearance, it refers to this process. Section 321 of the Tariff Act of 1930 says, in so many words, if it's not worth customs time and trouble to process an entry and accept customs duty, then no entry is required. And originally this was like 20 bucks or so, anything worth less than 20 bucks qualified for a section clearance. Now it's $800. This is heavily used in the small package business. So if, if you're importing something by the <clears throat> via the purple guys or the brown guys or the yellow guys, um, and goes through their hub, most of those shipments are cleared using a section clearance. Whether they're commercial or whether they're non-commercial, under 800 bucks, no entry is required, except customers want a little more visibility on those shipments. So it started a type 86 entry now where uh, certain section items that would fall in the de minimis level are now require a declaration in the ACE system. So that is something that's coming to give customers more visibility about what's in these shipments. Okay, de minimis, by the way, that's another great Latin expression, meaning it's just that, it's, it's so small, it's trivial. Okay, most clearances now, as I already said, are electronic and most shipments are cleared using ACE cargo release. And that process works like this. Um, shipments coming from Canada and Mexico might be a little bit different process, but shipments coming from other places in the world or coming by air freight from Canada and Mexico are gonna follow the primary clearance process. And that is when the shipment leaves the country of export, um, the importer or a broker on its behalf files a declaration a minimum electronic data. It's electronic declaration, declaring what's in the shipment. And based on that electronic data, customs computer will determine whether or not uh, the shipment needs to be examined and whether or not hard copy entry documents will be required. But most of the time it's cleared electronically and no examinations required. That's the entry by itself. However, that's followed within two weeks, the importer has to file either hard copy or electronic customs form 7501. 
and that's used, it's shared with the Bureau of Census for calculating the country's trade statistics. And it's also the, the mechanism by which duties are paid. All right. And I think we're gonna be talk about this a little bit more, more detail uh, shortly. Okay, bonds. If you're an importer, you get the, the task of administering your company's bonds. Now, if you're an importer and all you got is one company, it's incorporated maybe in Delaware or something like that. Okay, you got one corporation and one corporation is doing the importing. Then you have one imp EIN number. That goes by different names. It could be the employer's identification number. It can be the exporter's identification number if you're exporting because they use the same number. And, uh, or it can be the IRS employer's number. Okay, and that is linked to a bond. As I mentioned before, a bond is a guarantee. So, uh, just on the previous slide, described the entry process where um, the importer or broker on their behalf files electronic data with customs. And when the shipment gets here, either it's released or customs will want hard copy documents. Most of the time the shipment's released and not examined, goes on its way. That's an expedited clearance process. Okay, now what's the guarantee if you are importing something and it's released electronically? By released means you can take it home with you. Okay, so you, it comes in, customs says, we don't need to look at it, shipment's released, you arrange for a trucker to go pick it up and take it to your place of business. You haven't paid any duty yet on that or any fees or anything. What's the guarantee that you're gonna do that? The bond guarantees that. Bond guarantees that within two weeks, you are going to file a custom form 7501, either hard or soft copy, and you're gonna pay all applicable duties, fees, 301s, and all that other stuff you may have to pay. And as I mentioned before with the frozen shrimp, if food and drug wants to take a sample of the ship, it's gonna guarantee that you're gonna provide that sample to food and drug. If a Consumer Product Safety Commission needs to recall a shipment to, because it doesn't meet CPSC requirements, it's gonna guarantee that you're gonna do that too. So that's the purpose of a bond. There are two basic types of bonds, a single transaction or a continuous bond. Single transaction is just that. It's a bond that covers one entry. And it's in the amount usually of entry plus duty, but if you got something that's subject to food and drug requirements or ITAR requirements or other types of requirements, the bond can be substantially more. That could be three times the value of the shipment. Okay, so a single transaction bond, how do you get one of those? Customs broker or surety company can get those for you. Okay, and a surety, there's another great expression. That's a French word. And when you pronounce it, uh, you put an H in it, surety, but when you spell it, there's no H in it. So all I can say, it's a French word. And a surety is an insurance company. And there are certain insurance companies who can, it's not all insurance companies, it's specified insurance companies can issue customs bonds. And I believe that's in part 113 of the regs. You can read up on that. Okay. And single transaction, once again, that's good for one entry. And once that entry is done, then, this, um, then the bond is satisfied and all everything's cool. Single transaction bond is gonna cost several hundred dollars. You get one either from a surety agent, which is Avalon or somebody like that. You can buy one directly from them or Roanoke is another company that issues uh, bonds. You can buy one from them, it's gonna cost you several hundred dollars or a customs broker can get one for you. If your company only has one or two import shipments a year, a single transaction bond might be a good way to go. However, most importers import more than that. And paying several hundred dollars for a bond fee every time you import something doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So in that case, you may want to go get a continuous entry bond. You can get a continuous entry bond, uh, once again, through a surety. Um, or surety agent, I mentioned Avalon, Roanoke, there's other ones out there, you know, one directly through them, or a customs broker can obtain this for you. Continuous entry bond, best way to think of it, think about your car insurance. And so you uh, go get car insurance to cover your uh, vehicles and the drivers in your household are all in that, on that insurance policy. And so no matter, 
which one of those covered persons drives the car or which car they're driving, it covers covers them for a year, right? Because the insurance policy is good for a year. At the end of the year, normally the car insurance policy, in my experience, normally they increase the premium every year. But as long as you go on paying the premium, that insurance policy covers you. It covers you and other people who are listed on the insurance policy and cars are listed in the insurance policy, et cetera. Continuous entry bond works the same way. It's good for a year. And no matter what ports you import through or how many entries you have, they are all covered by that, that continuous entry bond. And as long as you continue paying the premium on it, then it continues to cover those shipments. Okay, so I recommend if you got more than two import shipments a year, you should be using a continuous entry bond because um, single transaction bonds don't, under those circumstances, don't make sense, too darn expensive. Okay, you continuous entry bond, you can apply through your customs broker. They're gonna ask you like, how many shipments do you have or how many shipments do you expect to have? What types of commodities do you import? And that all goes into a calculation that's sent to customs and customs based on the info, info will tell you how big of a bond you have to have, what the limit of liability on that bond will be. I already introduced an EIN number. That's how customs identifies who the importer of record is, okay? Or if you're exporting stuff, it goes on the EEI and identifies who the exporter of record is. Because customs, uh, when you file an entry, uh, the name and address of the importer goes on there, but that's not how your computer keeps track of who the importer is. The importer, they keep track of who the importer is by the importer's EIN number. So when the customs computer sees an EIN number, they say, oh yeah, that's that's Acme Importing Company. And so they don't need anything further. Okay. All companies, if you're incorporated in the United States, you're gonna have an EIN number. And each EIN number, if you're an importer, you have to register with customs on customs form 5106. That can be done through the ACE portal, I believe, uh, or your customs broker can handle this for you. Or if you're obtaining a bond, a surety agent, I mentioned Roanoke and Avalon, there's other ones out there too, they can do it for you. So any of those parties can do a 5106 for you. And unless the EIN is registered in the 5106, customs doesn't know who you are and everything's gonna stop until you do this. So make sure you register with Customs Border Protection on a 5106 form. Another thing that's valuable about registering in a 5106 form is on that form, which is done primarily electronically nowadays, and it's a detailed form, by the way, it's like three pages. And on the 5106, you have to list who the officers of your company are and where they live and all this other great stuff. Um, it used to be one page form, that's the one everybody liked, but anyway, customers wanted more info, so it's now a three page form you have to fill out. Okay, so you do the 5106, and on the 5106, you can indicate the mailing address. So if you work in the import compliance function, and you want any correspondence, bills, refunds, liquidation notices, any of that kind of stuff, if you want those things going to your mail stop at your company, um, then put that down as the mailing address at the corporation. That may be different than the corporation's address. So that can be done by 5106. Or you can have all that stuff sent to your customer broker if that's what you want to do. And there's a mechanism for doing that. Okay, so as the third bullet, bullet down there says, that number and the address associated with that number is used for sending refunds and bills. Does customs actually send you a check for a refund? Yeah, hey, more on that default too. And they said they can send you a bill or this can be done electronically through the ACE portal and other notices like form 28s and 29s and penalty notices and all that other stuff is sent to the address on the 5106. Okay, and just a final note down there, um, Congress passed legislation, the president signed it, I believe, and President Obama signed it in 20, 2016, passed a legislation, did all kinds of things, but amongst the things it did was requiring customs to look into establishing a different number other than the AON number to track who the importer is. So this may be a change that's in the works. Okay. You're an importer, once again, you can file your own 
entries if you want, clear your own shipments. That's assuming you know what you're doing and you've got the right software and everything to do it. Okay. And when I was at Hughes, uh, we did do our own clearances and we had software we obtained from an outside, outside vendor and that all worked fine. The hardest part, by the way, was non-custom stuff. And that is a messenger service that picked up documents for us, a trucking service that delivered shipments for us, and a bank account, a separate bank account for paying duties and cargo fees and all this other stuff. Anyway, you can always do that. Most importers don't do that. They outsource it. And they outsource that to a customs broker. And customs licenses customs brokers. They can be individuals, they can be partnerships, or they can be corporations. A broker could take any one of those forms. And there are nationwide brokers, and there are brokers who only have offices in a single port of entry. And however, for a broker to work on your behalf, they have to be appointed. And the mechanism for doing so is a power of attorney. That has nothing to do with how strong a lawyer is. Power of attorney is a commonly used legal document um, pointing somebody as your agent. Maybe you've got a favorite grandmother and your grandmother is getting up in years and can't make it to the bank anymore. And she doesn't know about banking online and what have you. So you're her favorite grandchild and she wants to point you as her agent to go make deposits and withdrawals and all that kind of stuff with a bank. What she's going to have to do is give you the bank a power of attorney appointing you as her agent for that purpose. Same idea. So with the customs broker, you appoint them on a, using a power of attorney. And the customs, there's a customs form for it, CBP form 5291. If you read that form, first of all, it's in like size eight font. And so you may have to wear reading glasses or a magnifying glass to read all the print on it. Um, that's what's commonly used though. But if you also read it, you realize it's a sexist document because it starts out by saying, all know, know all men by this, these presents that blah, 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 blah. It doesn't say anything but women on it, okay? And it also uses this archaic language. So in my own corporate history, we didn't use that form. We, make, we did our own power attorney and that's okay to do. And um, wait till we get to the next page. It has to be executed by the owner of a company if it's a sole proprietorship or an officer of the, of a corporation. So if you work for an importing company, unless you're a vice president of that company, um, you probably cannot sign a, a customs power of attorney. Um, that you have to take it to go have it signed off by an officer of the company. Typically that's a president, vice president, secretary, or treasurer. Those are the typical officer positions and they, they're the people who can sign the power of attorney. I worked at Hughes Space and Communications Remember the, um, the corporate attorney was this guy, Keith Knockett. And we had to have several powers of attorneys signed off. And when it's signed off, by the way, we strongly recommend, strongly recommend the power of attorney be witnessed or notarized or sealed. And I think customers is tightening up on these requirements because there's no, right now there's no specific requirement that if you're getting a power of attorney that you have to have it notarized or sealed or witnessed. I strongly recommend that you do because it lends validity to the document. So anyway, when I was Hughes, with Hughes Space and Communications, we needed several powers of attorney. We went to the corporate secretary, Keith Naka. I said, Keith, I remember one time I had a conversation with him. I said, Keith, I hope we're not bugging you uh, by having you sign off those power of attorney and apply the corporate seal. And he says, oh no. He says, he says we rarely get to use the corporate seal. And when you come to us with a power of attorney, it's about the only time we ever get the get the uh, power the corporate seal out of the uh, cabinet and apply it to a document. And we think it's great. So go ahead and send them over. We'll do it. All right. So anyway, one of those things has to apply. I said you can make you can use either use the customs form fifty two ninety one or you can do your own power of attorney. As long as it has the key elements on it, you can get out do this in Word. When I was at Hughes and Boeing, this is how we did it. We, uh, we did our own power attorney as a Word document. Okay, it has to have the name, corporate address, and the state of incorporation of the import of record, plus their EIN number. Okay, 
has to have the name and address of the broker who's being appointed by this power of attorney. It lists a list of ports in which it's valid. You can also make the power of attorney valid for all ports. And if that's what you want, do it. I strongly recommend you do just that. Um, acts that the broker is empowered to perform you for you. Obtain bonds, clear shipments, do all that kind of stuff. However, you can make a power of attorney that empowers the broker to file one entry for you or empowers the broker to file entries for you in Progresso, Texas and no place else. Whatever you want, whatever you feel is appropriate, you can word that power of attorney accordingly. Most powers of attorney are pretty general in nature. They're valid for all ports and empowers the broker to obtain bonds, file entries, uh, do all that kind of stuff on behalf of the importer. Period of validity. There are many power of attorneys I've seen over the year. And, oh, I pluralized it incorrectly. The correct pluralization is powers of attorney, uh, not, not power of attorneys. Okay. Many I've seen over the years, when it gets down to period of validity, it's, it, they say it's valid until revoked. Well, that means you could have a power of attorney that's 20 years old and is signed by somebody who's re retired or deceased, and it's still valid. Um, it's probably not a good practice. I would recommend you make the power of attorney valid for like three years or five years. But if you're appointing a, a customs broker, you, you should have a contract or purchase order with that broker. And it should be maybe the same period of time. If the purchase order of the broker is good for three years, our attorney is good for three years. Okay, it has to be signed by the owner or officer and let's say witnessed and notarized and have corporate seal. And the original is filed with, not with customs. Customs has a right to see it, but they were filed with a customs broker. If you send that to customs broker, you know, send in the original, send it by FedEx or registered mail or something, we got a receipt showing they received it. And the customs broker keeps the original on file. And if they have different ports of entry throughout the United States, they can send them out copies of it to their different ports and say, original's on file at this port and here's all, and keep a copy of it, of course, for yourself. Okay. And here's the ACE program and ACE cargo release. Okay, ACE already described that. And uh, single window, I described, described all that kind of stuff. So let's keep going here. It's on a government server um, and customs brokers, other party, parties write a compatible software. So the customers ACE portal is a uh, government program, but brokers will write their own software to implement it for themselves. Okay, and if you're an importer, recommend strongly sign up for ACE portal. Um, you have great visibility over what's going on. Um, one of the things when I was at Boeing, I got to be, I was like the assistant uh, administrator of the East portal. And one of the things we did is what was called the um, illegal broker report. And what I meant by that is all customs brokers have a unique code that identifies them. It's usually an alpha and numeric code who identifies who the broker is. And we knew the alpha numeric codes of the brokers that we were using who were appointed legally appointed by by us and so what we do is quarterly we'd do a, um, a go into ace portal and ask for a report by broker id number or by broker id and what we'd be looking for is brokers who who were not appointed by us who are clearing our ship butts. and about every time we did one of those reports shipment would turn up an entry would turn up that was filed by a broker who did not have a power of attorney from us. So then we would send a little love note over to that broker saying, broker, we, we have learned that you filed entry number so-and-so at port number such and such. And to our knowledge, you don't have a power of attorney from us to do that. And a couple of times they responded by sending me a 20 year old power of attorney signed by a marketing director or somebody like that. And so we do is say, okay, um, you did have legal authority to clear the ship, but however, we're revoking that power of attorney. And, and don't do this anymore. Here's the name and address of our broker and, and the, that port of entry and turn it over any, anything, turn it over to them for clearance. And other times, it, 
they were what are called free domicile shipments or uh, DDP shipments, where the importer record is supposed to be the foreign company. And yes, foreign companies can be importers of record in the United States. However, brokers usually don't like to deal with that situation. So they wind up clearing it in the name of Boeing and hoping that we wouldn't notice, but we did. Okay, so that's a great report. It's all kinds of other reports you can get out of there, liquidation reports and everything else. Okay, so it's great to do. Um, Customs has access to the same data. So if Customs is thinking about auditing an importer, uh, what uh, Customs regulatory auditors will do is they'll go into the ACE portal and they'll take a look at your import data. And what are they looking for? They're looking for trouble. And they're looking for, are you importing stuff under chapter, claiming it duty free under chapter 98? Or are you importing stuff in, under free trade agreements? They're gonna be looking for things like that. Or are you importing stuff that's subject to dumping duty? So those are the kind of things that customers will be using that ACE portal for. And you can also get export, um, sign up for the ACE, export ACE portal, strongly recommend that. And sometimes you can just get the same kind of reports like what export shipments you've had and all the EI data that was filed and that kind of stuff. And um, some of our clients have done that and, went, and gotten those reports out of the export reports from ACE portal or they get it directly from Census Bureau. And what they've noticed is all these freight forwarders who are filing EEIs on their behalf and they had no idea who those forwarders are or how they got the authority to do that. So that's something to look for on the export side. Okay. Okay, ACE cargo release is formally called simplified entry. It's now become the primary way clearances are done. This is first run as a trial program. And the idea here, and this is where customs actually work with the trade. And this is a good pr program where they work together saying the concept here is um, we want to expedite the clearance process. We got all those containers stacking up at the port of LA Long Beach or, or at the airport or they, wherever the freights come in. We need a simplified, expedited way of clearing those shipments. Um, or getting all the routine shipments, let's deal with those quickly and get them out of the way so customs can focus its resources on importers who either are new or doing stuff that's illegal and our cargo that needs to be examined for bad stuff in it. So that was the whole idea. So customs and the trade got together and they devised this program. First, they ran it as a trial program, and later on, the trial program became the way things are done. East cargo release. Okay, the idea here is what is the minimum amount of data that customs needs to determine whether the shipment coming to the U.S. is, first of all, admissible. In other words, not illegal, kind of stuff that can be imported. It gives enough information to determine uh, whether the cargo needs to be examined or released. That's a description of the cargo. It's in sufficient detail to make that determination. Should it be examined or should it be released? And, uh, and is it subject to maybe other government agency requirements? Okay, so flag can be maybe flagged for that purpose too. And they agreed on a certain set of data. Okay, you transmit that data to customs when the shipment leaves the country of export or when it's out in the ocean. And Customs can, computer can process that through a process called selectivity. And then the release can happen before the goods arrive. So it's the, air, the shipment is still in the air or still in the water and the shipment can already be released. So when it gets here, importer can make arrangements or the broker can make arrangements, go down and pick up the cargo and deliver it. And right now a Customs 7501 is still required to pay duties as do within 10 working days after release. File a 7501, it's done mostly electronically nowadays. And that's how you pay duties and fees and 301s and all this other stuff you may have to pay. Okay, what's a 301? That's, that's coming, all right. And Customs though is working on a trial program. They would like to work towards a system, think of your credit card bill. Once a month, you get a credit card bill from Visa or whoever. And what do you see on the bill? It has all your credit card transactions listed on there and maybe who the transaction was with and the date of the transaction and how much was paid via the credit card. And then at the bottom of it, uh, the bill, list the total amount you owe. So they can go pay that amount and look forward to the bill coming next month. 
they would like to go to a system like that for imports as well. So if shipments come in, they're released electronically. And instead of filing a 7501, at the end of the month, you get a statement and on the statement will list all the entries you had that month and what entry it was and when it happened and where it happened and how much duty and other things you have to pay. And there'll be a grand put total on there and you can pay that grand total by electronic funds transfer or some other mechanism. They're working towards that, but there's a few inherent problems in that, some of which are caused by the way the law reads. And so work in process. Okay, ACE cargo release data elements, just take a look at those. Here are the minimum cargo release data elements required for ACE cargo release. Import a record number, that's EIN number, the buyer's name and address, and that's usually the importer's name and address, the buyer's EIN. The reason why that sounds a little duplicative there is sometimes the importer record maybe as a, a distributor or somebody like that, or could even be a customs broker or it could be a foreign company, could be the importer record. And the buyer is the party that actually placed the order that resulted in the goods being imported in the United States. Most 99% of the time, importer record and the buyer are the same party, but they can be different. And so this sounds a little bit of repetitive data. However, it's, uh, it, they're, they had to set this up so it handles that situation. Seller's name and address at the party in the other country that sold the goods to the United States. Manufacturer supplier's name and address. That could either be the supplier is either the party that sold the goods to you, or it could be the party in the foreign country you actually made the goods. Okay. Tended HTS number or numbers. Country of origin of the goods, which could be different than the place where the seller is located. Bill lading or house airway bill. The lading issuer code. Uh, that could be the air freight, air, the airline code, or it could be the um, the marine carriers code, et cetera. Entry number, entry type, and estimated shipment value. There's your minimum data elements, transmit electronic customs, that gets the shipments released. Cool. So that's the customs import process. Now let's take a look at some customs programs out there. And when I say customs programs, these are things programs. If you're an importer, you don't have to participate in any of these programs if you don't want to or don't see any value in them. But Customs strongly recommends that you do participate in them, and they do provide some benefits for you. Oh, exception to the rule. Center's excellence expertise, everybody has to do that one. And we'll talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about some of these programs and what's going on there. CTPAT. This started after the 9-11 attacks. And what was realized at that time is that customs did not know what's in the shipments until they arrived. So at the, at the ports or airports or the border crossings and et cetera in the United States, customs had no knowledge of what's in the shipment until the shipment arrives. So the shipment could have nasty stuff in it, but they had no knowledge of it until the broker came along, filed an entry, and on the entry, it uh, gave them information indicating who the foreign seller is and what the items in the shipment are and how they're classified and all that good stuff. So the government went to customs and said, you need to go beyond what's simply you know, on the entry, describe the entry is what's, you need visibility over what's coming to the United States. So if there's something bad coming to the United States, a bomb or whoever, or some of their nasty stuff coming to the US, we need some visibility over that. And fortunately, uh, this is another area where they work with the trades. They went to the importers. They went to what's called the COAC committee, which is a customs and trade committee and said, okay, how should this program look and how should it work? So to this day, CTPAT is a voluntary program. So you don't have to sign up for it if you don't want to. There's about 10,000 participants. I'd say about 8,000 of them are importers and also customs brokers and 3PLs and, and those kind of parties, even foreign, some foreign manufacturers can sign up to be participants in CTPAT. And it's because originally for, for importers only, but now includes also there's an export CTPAT program. And if you have experience with European, European community customs, 
you might know they have something called the AEO program. Well, AEO is like the European community version of CTPAT, except it's actually a more comprehensive program. And a lot of other countries like Japan and I think Mexico and Canada and Australia, they all have similar programs. And most of those places, they also call it AEO, Authorized Economic Operator Program. But in the US, we still call it CTPAT, and it's primarily for importers. Well, if you're an exporter, you can sign up too. Okay. Okay. So you're thinking about signing up for CTPAT. And at Boeing, I was the, uh, myself and another person, we were the CTPAT um, application managers. So you, myself and my, my, my colleague, Ted, we were the ones responsible for our application to customs back in 2002 to sign up the company for CTPAT. And it was a lot more complicated in those days. Nowadays, it's all done online. And so if you're interested in signing up for CTPAT, go to customs, cbp.gov, go to the trade page. And on the trade page, it's probably under security programs or something like that. You can just do a search CTPAT. And they'll help you through the application process. You can call an 800 number and the person will take you by the hand and uh, show you how to sign up for it and uh, what's required, et cetera, et cetera. And they make it as easy as possible. There's no, and there's no charge for it. You can sign up, it doesn't cost you anything. At least in terms of customs fees, it doesn't cost you anything. Okay, so you sign up. You, to do so, they're gonna ask you about your, um, your supply chain security requirements. In other words, the company importer, their foreign suppliers, do their foreign suppliers have security measures in place? Um, I remember once I listened to a presentation by J.C. Penney, and they're describing the factories that they um, buy wearing apparel from in Central America. And a couple of those countries were not entirely safe places <laughs> to do this kind of stuff, because what would happen is somehow the information would leak. J.C. Penney had a container of uh, wearing apparel headed to the port. And it would get hijacked, actually. Bandits would come along and hijack the shipment. So they had to put a, a caravan system in place. They'd load up all the trucks with, with the containers on them, all the wearing apparel, and they had armed escorts and they all moved together down to the port. Well, that's a good security practice and helped get JCPenney approved for CTPAT program. It's okay. Also, they wanna know what carriers are you using? And do you have supply chain security requirements in place for those carriers, or those carriers already have supply chain security requirements, most do. So you can ask the airlines you're importing from, do you have supply chain security requirements in place? And most of them come back and say, yes, we do. We have ISO um, requirement number so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. And that's all great information that should go in your application. Okay. and. So you either have to describe what requirements you already got in place for supply chain security or the ones that you plan to put in place and when will that happen? Okay, the next step is after you've applied, they're gonna come out and pay you a visit. Customs has a special branch where, and in that branch are supply chain security specialists. If you want a kind of a neat job with customs and I think the, the pay grade is pretty good, and where you travel a lot, both domestically and internationally, and that sounds good to you, apply to customs for a supply chain security specialist position, because that's who does this. Um, the supply chain security specialist will take, pay you a personal visit. And when they come to your place of business, they may spend a day or two there. And it's not an audit, it's a validation that in your application, you said you had this and this and this in place, for supply chain security, they're gonna validate that you got those things in place. Or maybe you said, we're going to put such and such in place. Okay, how does that stand? Are you implementing it? Has it already been implemented? So they wanna see stuff like that when they come out for a validation. Uh, at Boeing, they looked at our closed circuit TV cameras at the plant in Renton, Washington, where they have 737s. And another thing that actually was in our favor is all all uh, shipments entering that facility in Renton, Washington, they have bomb sniffing dogs that sniff all the trucks for explosives. 
And we actually did a demo for a supply chain security specialist where they put fake explosive inside, they hid it inside of a truck and the truck entered the uh, examination area or the gate and the dog went right to it. So that was pretty impressive. So they, if you got stuff like that in place, they want to look at it. Okay, it's good. They will then also take a look at, they'll go to the country where one or more of your suppliers are located. So if you have suppliers, for example, in Indonesia who make stuff for you, they may go to Indonesia and actually visit those suppliers. So if you said your suppliers have certain security practices in place, they may want to visit those suppliers to verify that those things are all in place. So once again, this is a validation, validating the information you provided them. Or if there's a plan in place to provide security, how does that plan stand right now? Okay, when it's all done, uh, they'll come back to you and they'll tell you the, uh, uh, we did the validation, both the domestic and the foreign validation, and did they'll tell you if you pass, if you didn't pass, I'd say 90% of the companies will pass or agree even higher percentage than that. But if you don't pass, it's gonna tell you what you do need to do to fix it. And if you did pass, they're gonna tell you whether you're level two or level three importer. Level three importer is a special uh, special club you can belong to because there's not too many of them. There's a few hundred in the United States that have not just good security program in place, they have what are called best practices. I mentioned the bomb sniffing dogs in place that helped get Boeing uh, level three importer status in CTPAT. I don't know if the company still is, I hope they are. Um, kind of lost track of that, okay. and. What's, why would you do all this? Well, they promise benefits to qualifying importers. And this has been a bit of a controversial thing. What it's supposed to give you is fewer cargo examinations. So if you're filing that advanced data, one of the pieces of advanced data that you have that is transmitted to customs is the EIN number of the importer or the buyer of the goods or both, okay? So that EIN information is transmitted to a customs computer, customs computer can then look, oh, they're a CTPAT participant. And that reduces the, the opportunity that customs may want to do a physical examination on the shipment. The customs does a physical examination on a ocean freight shipment. And like the port of LA Long Beach, that process is gonna take like two weeks and wind up costing you a couple of thousand dollars at least for that to happen. So if you don't want that happening, Sign up for CTPAT. It's going to reduce, it'll re, it won't prevent it from happening. It'll reduce the opportunity for it to happen. Okay, now the next step in this, customers came out with a program called the ISA program, Importer Self-Assessment. This is kind of an interesting program. And, and that is if importer agrees to maintain adequate internal controls for import compliance, customs will exempt them from audits. This has undergone some revisions in recent years, but for the most part, that's still good. All right. And that is, you can apply to customs for entry into what's called the Importer Self-Assessment Program. So go to cbp.gov, go to the Trade tab, and look up Importer Self-Assessment Program, or simply do a word search on ISA. And what, they're gonna, what you're going to find there is not just the application process. And once again, though, it's free, and they'll guide you through that process. But there also is a good document published there, which outlines internal controls, internal controls for customs compliance. And I could do a whole nother class on this one, but internal controls, customs uses what's called COSO-based controls. If your company has an internal audit function, if you were to go to the internal audit function and say, do you guys use COSO-based controls? I'll bet the internal auditors know exactly what you're talking about. Anyway, COSO-based controls broken down five elements. That's first of what's called a control environment. Does your company have a policy saying it's the policy of this company to comply with customs laws and regulations it's signed off by the CEO? Do you have a import compliance function? Do the people in that function have the tools and the training they need to do the job? Okay, so that's control environment. Next thing is a risk assessment. Um, if you're an importer, do you know what your import risks are for violating the regulations? Like maybe you're importing a whole bunch of stuff from Mexico using the USMCA, duty-free on the USMCA. Well, 
how are you managing that? That's a risk area. So, so the, because the next thing is control, like what are called control activities. If you have risk areas, risk for non-compliance, what are you doing to man manage that risk? Saying, yeah, we import a whole bunch of stuff from Mexico. Uh, we claim duty-free benefits under the USMCA. And we have all these procedures in place to minimize or eliminate that risk. Cool. That's good. And the next element is what's called information and communication. Do the import compliance people have all the information they need to assess risk and manage risk? So do they have access, for example, to purchase order placed, placed with foreign suppliers? They have access to accounts payable records to verify how much being paid to those suppliers. They have access to receiving reports to verify what's been received and what's the quantity that's been received. And do the import compliance people give training to different company functions, like give training to the traffic function or give training to the procurement function on import requirements, okay? So, and then the final thing is monitoring. If you're an importer receiving all these shipments and maybe you're getting all those shipments from Mexico uh, and claiming USMCA benefits on it, um, are you looking at the entries after they've been filed? Either copies of the entries that the broker sends you or you're looking in the ACE portal to determine, are we claiming USMCA benefits? Are they supported by the appropriate documentation? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, so those are the five elements of internal controls. That's the short version. Okay. All right. Trusted Trader. It's a program that was conceived originally. You had what I would say a, a special club of importers. Some of the major importers in the United States, they signed up for CTPAT. They signed up for ISA. They signed up for all this stuff. And then they went to customs. They said, okay, we, we are this inclusive club. We signed up for and been admitted to all these special programs. What are you going to do for us? Other than the usual stuff, what else can you do for us? So actually, Custom published in the Federal Register is saying, okay, we're proposing a trusted trader program where if you do all this great stuff, we're going to give you additional benefits. Additional ben benefits, cool. Okay, so what happened ultimately the ISA program was integrated in CTPAT and CTPAT trade compliance. You can still separately apply for uh, for uh, some of these things, but when you sign up for CTPAT, you can separately sign up for CTPAT trade compliance. But to do, which used to be the ISA program, to sign for ISA, you had to be a CTPAT participant, okay? And keep your participant current. Okay, so now, you can sign up for CTPAT and leave it at that, or you can sign up for what's called CTPAT Trade Compliance, which combines the CTPAT program and the ISA program into one. And oh, why would you ever want to do that? If you're an ISA or CTPAT Trade Compliance member, you are exempt from customs audits. Can you imagine the IRS doing this? You could have a uh, taxpayer self-assessment program where if you can show that you have appropriate internal controls to make sure that you follow tax returns and your tax returns are, are correct, uh, that they'll exempt you from IRS audits. I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon, but customs does it, but it's not all audits. It's some audits they exempt you from, but that's good. All right, so it's kind of a unique program that when customs goes out to determine who's, who are we gonna audit this year? And they go down the list and say, oh, these guys are ISA members. We'll skip over them and go pick on somebody else. Well, you, that's, that's where you want to be. Okay. So Trusted Trader is the latest version of all this stuff. So you sign for CTPAT, CTPAT, Trade Compliance. And now you want to be signed for Trusted Trader Program. Um, you have to be CTPAT tier th two or three. You have to be a U.S. or Canadian resident importer. A Canadian company can be an importer into the United States. Okay, have a minimum of two years import experience. So you can't be you know, all new to this stuff. You have to have two years importing experience minimum and no evidence of financial debt to CVP. In other words, you can't owe customs for duties and penalties and fees and all that kind of stuff. Okay, that's be current. Okay, and 
to apply for the trusted trader program. Um, you have to be a CTPAT participant. Okay. And they've got some questionnaires you have to fill out. Then you have to fill out a memorandum of understanding. This will be signed off by either the compliance manager or an officer of the company. Cool. Once submitted, the tr trade compliance team, those will be the supply chain security specialists and maybe somebody from trade compliance or reg audit or account manager will review your application and may pay you a personal visit to make sure that everything you put in your application for the trusted trader program is complete and accurate. Okay, once you're admitted to the program, you have to provide customs an annual notification letter. So um, you send a letter once a year to customs, it's only a page or two, but in that thing, you say, okay, here are the changes that have taken place in, in, in our company. Maybe we acquired a new business, we sold off a business, our customs function has moved over to a different part of the company, blah, 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 okay? And reaffirming our commitment to the requirements listed of the trade compliance MOU and other program documentation. And um, in there, if you kind of a, requirement I know that was there with the ISA program before, you had to tell customs that you've done so many internal assessments in the last year of your trade compliance program um, and what the results of those assessments were. I believe that's probably gonna be required in this document too. And you can submit that document electronically through the CTPAT trade compliance portal because you're gonna be given a special access to the CTPAT trade compliance portal. And so you, you can do it through there. You don't have to mail it, put it in the mail or anything else. Okay, cool. And if you're admitted to the trusted ISA and trusted trader program, here are the benefits they'll give you. Okay, first of all, exemption from audit. So customs will not audit you. And what they mean by as a, um, a focused assessment audit. There are other audits out there that we'll talk about probably tomorrow called a quick response audit or a audit survey. And quick response audit is like an in and out audit to uh, examine one issue, maybe whether you're violating somebody's pat copyright or, or trademark or a, um, or, or maybe you're importing stuff subject to dumping, you're not paying dumping duties. So that's a quick response audit. And they'll come in and take a look around, check out that one issue and then hopefully be done and hopefully you pass and they go away. All right, I shouldn't say. You politely excuse the auditors who come to visit you, all right. Or audit survey. That is a actually a questionnaire that customs can send you. And on the questionnaire, they may pick on certain transactions. Say, okay, regarding these transactions, send us all the following information and something that they can do uh, without leaving their office and you not leave your office either. And once you're admitted to the trusted trader program, maybe the parent company got admitted to the trusted trader program. Later on, if your company has wholly incorporated, separately incorporated subsidiaries, for example, or different business divisions, you can apply to have them added as well. So I don't know if this is true, but let's use General Motors as an example. Well, maybe the Chevrolet division of General Motors applies to the trusted trader program and it gets admitted. And after a while, everything's going well. So they say, okay, let's admit the Cadillac division. And so they apply and they can, then the Pad Cadillac division. And then we say, okay, let's um, bring in the Buick division, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, those are not separately incorporated subsidiaries, but those are business units and they can be brought in or separately incorporated subsidiaries can be brought in. Okay, another benefit is access to a national account manager who acts as an advisor and liaison on customs headquarters and CTPEC trade compliance member. Okay, um, this can actually be a good thing. My experience with Boeing, where we had a national account manager, first of all, a great guy. He's a car guy, so he and I would talk car stuff. And uh, he could run interference for us and help us out with difficulties we're having. And so this is a good thing. If you get a good account manager, that person can be an ally to you and somebody who can help deal with the bureaucracy. So that's a good thing. Okay, let me deal with, with one last subject. 
centers of excellence and expertise. Most of the different customs programs you can sign up for. Just to recap, you don't have to sign up for any of them, but they encourage you to sign up for, in the minimum, sign up for CTPAT. And once you get into that, you can decide if you want to go further into the CTPAT trade compliance program or the trusted trader program. Those are different levels of trade compliance. Okay. Centers of excellence and expertise. Just that. Now, the way things have been done for a long, long time is that at the different ports of entry throughout the United States, they would have, uh, at least at the major ports of entry, they would have groups of import specialists. Those are customs people who deal with commercial importers. So they would have import specialists stationed at the ports of entry. For example, when I was an import specialist, first it was at LA Long Beach, and I was in an office that dealt with imports of toys and firearms. It's a strange combination, but they were next to each other in the harmonized tariff. So that's why, why we went up for that one. And then I was a import specialist team leader at LAX and I dealt with electronic components of all different kinds, like a chapter 85 stuff, and also watches and clocks. And it's not like a strange combination too, but that was when digital watches were there and they used the electronic components there in chapter 85. So I dealt with, and I dealt with the commercial, the importers who imported those things like Seiko or Mattel Toys and those kinds of folks. Okay, and um, that gave me a certain amount of expertise into how those things are classified and what problems or issues are associated with them. Well, that was fine. But LA and LA Long Beach and LAX are major ports. So they able to develop a certain amount of specialization expertise. There are other ports throughout the United States where maybe they only have two import specialist teams. One team handles the first half of the tariff the other team handles the other half of the tariff. So they don't get much specialization at all. So the idea here in excellent expertise is, okay, let's take all of our import specialists who deal in a certain commodity and let's combine them either physically or virtually, let's combine them in one office. And the first one makes actually a good example. First CEE was established as a trial program that would was pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals heavily imported the United States. A lot of issues associated with pharmaceuticals. First of all, they're difficult to classify because a lot of them are made up of all these different chemicals and compounds and whatnot. Um, unless you're a chemist, you may have difficulty classifying that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of them, there are, are trademark and copyright issues. There's are issues of them being ripped off. Uh, a lot of issues dealing with pharmaceuticals. So they established a first center of excellence expertise was for pharmaceuticals. They ran it as a trial. It was based in New York. However, they had import specialists from different ports around the United States who were on paper anyway, transferred to that CEE. They remained physically where they were, but on paper, they became virtual members of the CEE. So now they have 10 CEs. This, it, the trial program worked out very successfully. So now they have 10 CEEs located throughout the United States. Each one specializes in a group of related commodities. Okay, so how did this all how does this all work? Shipments are released at the, still released at the port of entry. So you get a shipment comes in at Progresso, Texas, or Great Falls, Montana, or where the case may be, or LA Long Beach or Baltimore, or where it's coming in, it gets released there. Okay, that's where Customs takes a look at the advanced data, decides, okay, that looks cool. And they either examine it or they release the ship and it goes on its way. And then the entry summaries, the 7501s and the duty collection and the post entry processing is all done at the CEE. So you're importing pharmaceuticals. They're cleared at the port of New Orleans. Uh, that's where the ship is released. Physically, it goes on its way. However, the uh, the, the custom 7501 uh, entry summary and any post entry things that might happen are all handled at the pharmaceutical CEE. So they separate those tasks, the release of the goods, it's port of entry, the post entry processing and duty collection are all done at the CEE, where people can, the import specialists can more specialize in that commodity and know the difficulties, know the problems and how those things are classified, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the CE. And all importers are assigned to a 
CEE, what, so whether you like it or not, you're assigned to one. And it's all based upon what's the primary commodity that your company imports? Is it wearing apparel? Is it machinery? Um, is electronics? Whatever the case may be, based on the primary type of product by tariff number that your product, you know, your company imports, you're assigned to a CEE. I think that for the most part, this is a good thing is now you're dealing with one office instead of a bunch of offices and you're dealing with a group of folks who uh, kind of understand more about your product now it's classified. And if you're having an issue with one of the ports of entry or something, you can actually go to the CE and they can help straighten things out for you. Okay. And if you don't like the CE you're, you're assigned to, you can apply to customs to be assigned to a different one. Okay, but you have to, has to be based on valid da data other than, I don't like the people there. Oh, well, that's not gonna work. So you can say, oh, we also import the following types of products and we think maybe it's more appropriate that you put us on this other CE instead. Okay, all right, so that's how CEEs work. Um, right now, I'm looking at my watch and Mickey's hands are on the 35 mark. So we're gonna take a 15 minute break. So you've got until 10 minutes of the hour to go do whatever you need to do. And we'll come back online and start on tariff classification. This is a big subject. So we'll, let's probably take us the rest of the session today is to go through this topic. So go ahead and take a break. We'll see you in 15.
Okay, everyone. Hopefully, most or all of you were back because we're going to continue with the, with the class today. And we're going to cover the stuff that's on this little uh, sub menu here. But this is a lot of important stuff on this sub menu. So let's go take a look at all that stuff. All right. Classification, rulings, MPF and HMF. You don't know what those acronyms are, you will. ADD, CVD, these are really important acronyms. Free trade agreements, chapter 98 classifications. Each one of these we could do you know, like several hour class on, but we, we ain't gonna do that. Instead, we're gonna at least introduce you to these things. I was just gonna remark the subjects we've covered so far. And okay, Cover, subject we covered so far, we try to pick them and, and uh, cover them in a sense that if you work for an importing company, these are things you're gonna to have to deal with in one way or another. You have to pick the brokers. You have to uh, uh, issue, find, is, not issue powers of attorney, but obtain powers of attorney. Uh, you have to deal with all these valuation issues. You have to deal with whether you wanna join CTPAD or not and all this kind of stuff. It's gonna be pretty much in, in your hands that you have to do these things. So at any rate, and what we're covering now, this affects you directly too. And you may think that, oh yeah, uh, tariff classification, that's what my broker does. Well, um, they may do it for you or on your behalf. However, you're the party that's liable for it. So if the uh, broker did it wrong, um, you may fire them. You may be get angry with them or whatever the case may be, but you're liable. So if you owe extra money to the government, you have to pay the money. And if your boss says, how come we're paying all this money? And it's because you basically, you weren't giving enough information and getting involved enough in the classification process. Blame it on the broker, that might work, but it's not going, it won't work forever. Okay. Okay, classification and harmonized tariff schedule is the most important subject um, that we're gonna cover. And probably the most important one, if you work for an importer or work in import compliance anyway, this is the most important subject you're, you're gonna encounter. Okay, why HTS, harmonized? Why is it called harmonized? The tariff schedule that we use for both import and the schedule B used for export looks very similar. It's all the same chapters and, and sub chapters and headings and all this kind of stuff, they're all the same. Um, that harmonized tariff schedule, the reason why it's calling it, it was actually co conceived and written by the World Customs Organization in Brussels. And World Customs Organization is just that. It's, it's made up of the customs representatives of something like 175 different countries around the world. So I don't know if North Korea belongs to uh, um, the World Customs Organization or Somalia belongs to the World Customs Organization, but most other countries do. And they get together frequently and just that, they work on harmonization. One way to promote free trade is to um, make it easier to import and export around the world. And that's one of the jobs of the World Customs Organization. And so in doing that, they realized that countries around the world, and this has happened back in the 1970s and 80s, really different countries in the world had different numbering systems for imports and for exports. In fact, there used to be a time, wasn't that long ago, where this Schedule B used for exports was completely different than the, than the tariff schedule used for imports. So other countries did the same thing. The tariff schedules and they used for export and import were all different. So I thought, well, we need to get together, put our heads together and come up with one that looks the same. No matter where you go, it's gonna use the same terminology. It's gonna be organized in the same manager, ma manage in the same manner, I should say. And um, the tariff classifications are going to read the same way. Now the duty rates might be different, but the classifications all are going to all be the same. So all those countries, like 175 countries around the world, have all adopted the harmonized tariff. And so if you're uh, in China and you're importing stuff into China, uh, if you look at a copy of the Chinese import tariff, it's going to look the same way. So use the same chapters and, and sections and um, headings and subheadings, they're all gonna read the same way as are the chapter notes and what have you. It's okay. 
So this has been up here on the screen. So we'll just say, why should you sit up and pay attention to this subject uh, on tariff classification? First of all, it determines the duty rate. Also determines eligibility for free trade agreements. Not everything qualifies for a free trade agreement. There's a lot of free trade agreements and some of them um, don't include certain tariff classifications. Also indicates other government agency requirements. How does Food and Drug Administration uh, know whether the imported thing is subject to their jurisdiction? Because Food and Drug Administration goes through the harmonized tariff schedule, picks out the tariff classifications that apply to things they regulate, and they give that list to CBP that puts it in their computer. So if you import something that falls under one of those tariff numbers, um, you have to file a Food and Drug de Declaration, like a Laser rangefinder classified in chapter 90. That's subject to food and drug requirements. Why? Because it contains a laser. And because food and drug gave the tariff number for laser rangefinders to CBP. Also indicates whether a product is subject to anti-dumping or countervailing duties. Um, so if something is classified as wood furniture and it's coming from um, it's coming from China, well that may mean your ship is going to get a whole bunch of additional uh, attention. Terms of imports are subject to section 201, 232, or 301 duties. We already talked about 301 duties. Those are the special duties imposed on products of China. So if you're importing something from China, most likely it's going to be subject to 301 duties, which are either 12% or 25% in addition to all the other duties that are payable on that product. And that's all determined by tariff classification. As are section 201 duties on like solar panels and washing machines, or the 232 duties on aluminum and steel products, all determined by tariff classification. And tariff classification is also used for statistical reporting. So if you're listening to the news and they say, well, last month, are we had a trade deficit of so many jillion dollars? How do they know that? Because they're adding up all those numbers um, associated with all those harmonized tariff numbers on both export and import. And they add up all the numbers and it tells what our trade balance is and it breaks it down by tariff classification. What's our trade balance under this classification, et cetera, et cetera. Or if a uh, US trade representative, Thai, if she goes to um, a country to go to negotiate a, a trade agreement with them, she's gonna take those statistics with her. So that's, a, that's important. Okay, now, I already mentioned harmonized tariff schedule. You can get hard, buy a hard copy if you need to. If you're taking the broker's exam, you may have to do that. Um, or if you're come more comfortable with a, a paper document that you can flip through, I'll warn you, this is a huge document. Um, it's the size of, well, I used to say size of several telephone directories, but nowadays people might question what's a telephone directory. Anyway, it's a big book. Size several dictionaries put together. Okay, or you can go to the usitc.gov and get the latest, greatest copy online. Because you get the hard copy, what, what, every time they make revisions to it, and oftentimes there's a couple of revisions a year, they're gonna send you new pages. And you have to tear out the old pages and put it in the new page, it's kind of, kind of a pain. So I, that's one reason why I use the online version because it's, it's up to date. Okay. Mentioned before the cross search engine that's available at cbp.gov. Go to uh, CBP, go click on the trade page and scroll down. I think it's probably under um, tariff classifications or something like that. You'll find uh, the cross search engine, very useful thing. So another couple of tools uh, that are also very useful, but you have to pay for these ones. First of all, the World Customs Organization has also published the explanatory notes to the harmonized tariff. What they do is chapter by chapter, heading by heading, and sometimes subheading by subheading, they explain what kinds of products are classified under those provisions. They also may give definitions and stuff. When we say this, here's what that term means. So that's very useful information. And you can actually use explanatory notes as a guide to how things are classified. And uh, sometimes when you ask, if you ask for a ruling or something like that, you can actually cite the explanatory notes as the justification for the way in which you want something classified. Um, but you have to buy them. 
the explanatory notes, you have to order them from the uh, World Customs Organization. I think they cost you three or 400 euros to buy, so it's not gonna be cheap, okay. Or you can, another way, you can subscribe to a service called Customs Info. And maybe some of you already subscribed to it. It's a very useful um, tool. It's an online tool. You have to log in. When you log in, you can, it's got all the rulings that are in the cross database and more. It's got even more rulings than Customs has um, are searchable in there. It also has the explanatory notes or in Customs Info. It also has the tariff schedules of other countries are in there. So there's a lot of very useful information um, is in customs info, but you have to pay to subscribe to it. So convince your management that you need that tool. And, it, and I think it actually it'll pay for itself in terms of providing you information you need to do your job. Okay, I don't have nearly enough time to ever go through and tell you how to classify stuff um, that's a huge subject. Instead, let me tell you about some of the mechanics of classifying things. Um, first, let's get things in place. If Customs Regulatory Audit contacts you, and they say, we're considering you for an audit. And the first question we wanna ask you is, how do you classify the things that you import? If the answer is, oh, our broker does that for us, well, you've probably already failed the audit right there because if you're the importer of record, you are responsible for the accuracy of the things that you, uh, the tariff classifications you use for your company's products. Okay, so you need to learn how to classify stuff if you don't already, if you aren't already doing this. So the first thing to classify a product is you need a good description of the article. And here are some of the stuff, information that you're gonna need. What's it made of? Some things are classified according to the materials it's composed of plastic and rubber, wool fibers, et cetera, et cetera. How is it used? Is it used to test things? Is it used uh, to compute things? Um, is it used uh, in telephone systems? That's all gonna make a difference on how it's classified. Is it a part of something bigger? Many things are classified as parts. Part of this, part of that. So the question is, is it a part of something bigger? And I think part of it defined as, as something that is actually an essential component of a bigger article. In other words, so that the bigger article is not complete without it, as opposed to what? An accessory. An accessory is something that commonly used for the product, but it's not a part of an article and the thing works just fine without it. You get a, uh, a ski rack for your Porsche. Well. They, the Porsche is complete without having a ski rack on it, but maybe commonly, especially in states where they do a lot of skiing, maybe it's common to have ski racks on your Porsche, but the work car, car works just fine without it. That's an accessory. There are tariff provisions for accessories as well. How does it work? Oftentimes things are classified according to how it functions, like a semiconductor device. Well, is that used as a memory device or how has it worked? Okay, so um, that is another determining factor. And is it a part of group having articles of a generic name? Maybe your company imports a product and you have your own unique name for that product. However, that product falls within a bigger group of things which has a generic name to it. Let's think about Mattel toys. They're importing, they're importing Barbie doll, Barbies. That's what they call them. They call them Barbies, okay? But that's part of the group of Articles have a generic name, dolls, okay? So you get the idea here? So these are some questions to ask in figuring out how might this thing be classified? In some cases, you may need more information. And that gets down to the, final, the bottom bullet down there, ask an expert. Some things, especially like in chapter 85 or chapter 90, um, or some of the textile provisions, um, you may need more information than what we outlined up above. You may need to ask an expert, a, a scientist, an engineer, what the heck is this thing? And what does it do? And here are the choices I'm faced with. Where do you think it fits best? Okay, so finding information about the thing being imported. Uh, most people go by the invoice description. So 
how do we classify this thing? Well, here's what it's called on the invoice. That may or may not be enough information. Or how it's called, you look up the purchase order and the purchase order uses the same description. So that's not terribly useful either. Um, I found a uh, useful tool is the company intranet. That's the internal website. And on the company intranet, you may find drawings of that product. You may find marketing information regarding that product. You're gonna find more information by looking up that product on the company intranet or online. Um, a task I've had to do several times is with semiconductor devices is classify them for export purposes and not just the export schedule B, but in the commerce control list in category 3A001. And for that, I'm no electronics expert. So oftentimes I go, I Google even the part number. So okay, you got this integrated circuit. What kind of integrated circuit is it? Well, I'll go and look up the part number. I Google the part number. And I tell you, more than 50% of the time I find it online, along with maybe a picture of it or something like that. So that's helpful. Or ask an expert um, at Hughes Space and Communications Company, we imported parts to go into communication satellites. And fortunately, we had this gentleman, Marty Gale. Marty, great guy, very friendly, easygoing guy. And he had the gift that he could take something complicated and technical and explain it in layman's terms. So you need to find somebody like Marty. We import a satellite part and we, we had no idea how to classify this thing. So we went to Marty and said, Marty, we got this thing, what is it? And what are we trying to classify here? And uh, we'd give him the choices and he first he explained in layman's term what the thing was and what it did. And uh, then we, we give we show him, here, here are our choices and he helped us classify. It. So you need to find somebody like that. And if you find that person, be sure to buy them lunch with them on your Christmas lift, list, whatever it takes to make them your friend and keep them as your friend because they're gonna be helpful. Here's some classification best practices. Customs does something unique in that their audits, their are called, their most extreme audits are called focus assessments. I'm trying to remember the other name they're using for that. But anyway, intensive audits. Okay, intensive audits. Customs publishes its audit manual. Well, they didn't do this voluntarily. They're actually threatened with a lawsuit under the Freedom of Information Act and said, okay, we give in, we'll publish it. And in the meantime, they found out it's a good thing. And so you can go to Customs website, go to the trade page, look up probably an audits or something like that. Um, or focus assessment program. What you're going to find there is customs focus assessment handbook, not handbook. It's their audit manual. This is the manual that their regulatory audits take with them when they visit an importer. So that's a that's a great tool, especially if you're going to be undergoing an audit. Get you better get your hands on that manual and see which one of those which provisions apply to you and what do you have to do to be compliant. Okay, so this page, the stuff on this page is taken right out of their audit manual. Okay, here, don't rely on the, these are best practices for tariff classification. Don't rely on the customs broker. The broker can help you classify things, but the importer is ultimately responsible for the accuracy of the tariff classifications. So that's why I said, if you're gonna be audited and you tell them, oh, our broker classifies everything, wrong answer. If you're gonna be audited, they say, well, who classifies things? Say, we do, and as needed, we turn to our broker for assistance. That's the right answer, okay? Maintain a HTS classification listing or database. Make it available to all who need it, including the broker. Uh, many companies do this. They have a list of their products. This can be done on the export side too. It works just as well. They have a listing of all their products and by the description, maybe the part number, et cetera. And then next to that would be the tariff classification of that product. And if there's a ruling or something that applies to that tariff classification, list the ruling. If it's subject like a food and drug requirement or dumping duties or some other darn thing, put that down as well. So it's a useful tool. A lot of major companies have an HTS classification database. Some of the auto companies, their database has millions of parts in it. So it's like a full-time job for somebody. It's just maintaining, maintaining it. And they make it 
make it available to everybody who needs it. Who needs it? Well, internally, um, all your, your colleagues may need it, or maybe people in procurement may need it. Figure out, okay, we're thinking about buying this thing from foreign supplier. Do we have to pay duty on it? If so, how much? Well, they can use your classification database for that. And primarily, importers will do this by making it available to the customs broker. So when the broker gets an invoice, whether it's a hard invoice or a soft invoice, and it's got a description of the goods on it with part numbers and stuff, they can go look them up on the database and they know, oh yeah, this is the tariff classification we use. And if there's some, some kind of weird requirements, by the way, like dumping duties or you need an import license or a food and drug or something, put that in the database as well, because the broker is going to need that information. And importers I've known use what I call either a push system or a pull system for that. That uh, push system, it is that you send the database to your broker on a regular basis. At Boeing, I think we did it once a week or twice a week. We sent them our database because it changed that often. Um, hopefully they're still doing that. And other cases, the, the, um, they use what I call a pull system in that the broker has access to the importer's computer and they can go look it up on their own. And there maybe it's limited access and they keep the broker from going to other places where they don't belong, but they can go there to look up that classification database. Okay, so the best practice, a designated person, physician, not a person responsible for classification and make sure they have the tools and training. So a customs regulatory audit pays you a visit and they say, okay, who does your classifications? If you say Mary Jane does them, that's the wrong answer. If you say, we on our staff, we have compliance specialists and compliance specialists do the tariff classification. Maybe you only got one specialist on the staff, but refer to them in that matter. Compliance specialists, whoever occupies that position, they do the tariff classification and make sure they have the tools and training. So the auditor says, okay, we understand this position does the, the uh, tariff classification what, what training have they had on how to do that? Well, we sent them to the Foreign Trade Association class. Okay, well, when, when did that happen? And what proof do you have that that happened? Um, or uh, do they have access to the tariff schedule? Do they have access to cross search, cross database? Do they have access to in, customs info? Okay, show them all that stuff. And if, you, if that's what you're doing, you just pass that part of the audit. Re Review entries after the fact to ensure they were classified correctly. And um, that is, it's one thing to share a database or provide instructions to the broker saying, okay, here's how you classify this thing. Okay, or um, on this product, do not, this shipment we're getting from Canada, do not claim USMCA benefits on it because we can't prove it. Okay, now. It's, that's one thing to give them those sites for instructions. But the next thing is to follow up to see, did they follow your instructions? And uh, so that's something is do a post entry review or audit. Very important. You don't have to look at all the entries, but you might at a minimum spot check them to make sure that the, if you provided classifications of the broker that they're using the information that you gave them. And one of the best examples I saw with that was, uh, I visited, I used to work for a General Motors subsidiary and one of our sister companies was Delco Electronics in Kokomo, Indiana. And so I went to Kokomo, which is kind of a kind of neat town. I liked Kokomo. And uh, so I went there and visited the Delco function. And, and I don't know if they still, they're still around or whether they still do it this way, but at the time I thought, well, that, that's really good what they're doing. Is they provided a classification database to their broker. They actually had three brokers they used, but depending whether it's shipments from Canada, from uh, Mexico, shipments from Europe or shipments from the Far East. Um, they had three different brokers they used. They gave all three brokers the classification database. Then they did a post entry audit on selected entries. And if the broker was not, they were allowed like a 1% error rate. If the broker was not using the classifications given them and they did so more than 1% of the time, um, what Delco did was they were paying the broker by electronic funds transfer. 
that as soon as the shipments were cleared, the broker sent an electronic invoice to accounts payable in Kokomo, Indiana. Accounts payable paid them within 24 hours. If you're a broker, this is wonderful. You paid that quickly. Um, however, if the broker was making too many errors on classification, they were removed from electronic payment and they went to a manual payment system, which means they got paid in 30 days instead of 30 hours. That's a huge tool to use to make sure the broker is following the information you give them. And most of them do, but they make mistakes. And another best practice is ask for rulings. Customs doesn't mind if you ask them for rulings. Um, I've known importers say, well, you know, if we ask for a customs ruling, it's gonna, um, it's gonna raise attention. Their customs gonna be thinking, well, maybe they're doing things wrong and they have to ask for a ruling. Well, no, customs encourages you to ask for a ruling. That's viewed it as a best practice, ask for a ruling and use of reasonable care. If you're in doubt as to how something is classified, go ask for a ruling on it. That's best practice. Speaking of rulings, here's how this works. Um, so I mentioned a moment ago, asking for a ruling is evidence of reasonable care. What's that phrase reasonable care is important in the land of customs. Customs, and we'll get to this tomorrow, can issue penalties. And some of the penalties can be huge. And penalties can be assessed for uh, negligence or gross negligence. What's negligence? If you look up in a dictionary, especially a legal dictionary, negligence is absence of reasonable care. Absence of reasonable care is negligence. Customs can only assign, issue a penalty for negligence, gross negligence, or fraud. Now, fraud is deliberate behavior. You deliberately set out to cheat the government. Okay, that's no excuse for that one. But if you can, the customs proposes to assess a penalty on you, it can only be for negligent behavior. If you can prove that you're using reasonable care, they can't penalize you for that. You're off the hook. And that's has happened in the past. So need, that's, that's one sign of reasonable care. So you ask for a ruling. So you ask for a ruling and uh, you followed that ruling. Well, that's reasonable care. They can never issue a penalty for what you did. Even if they change their minds later. Okay. Okay, you can ask for a ruling on, I'd say majority of ruling requests are an HTS classification, but you can ask for ruling on all kinds of other things like country of origin marking or whether something is an assist or what is, all this other stuff. Okay, and here's the way it works currently. I have a feeling this is gonna undergo some changes. Classification ruling requests are sent to New York and the others are sent to Washington DC at the headquarters office. It can be sent as a, uh, you can use snail mail for this if you want to. But nowadays, at Customs website under the trade page, if you look up rulings, they have an electronic ruling request form. And you fill out the form online and you can send that electronically to Customs, all electronic and you can, attaching PDF copies of like um, schematics and descriptions and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's the way and you can request a ruling. If you send a ruling request, to customs in New York. And this is something I think that they're gonna be moving to CEEs if they haven't done so already. Um, anyway, the, the national import specialists are located in New York and you send the, the classification request goes to them. And normally in my experience, they respond within 30 days. So as long as the request, your request is complete and you give them enough information to work, work by, um, you get a response fairly quickly. 30 days, that's, that's pretty good. But if you send it to Washington, DC, they have no time constraints. They'll get it to it when they get to it. I got one pending right now on use of TIBs and gave them a format and description of the proposed transaction and all that kind of stuff. It's been a year and a half and no response. I bug them from time to time. In fact, the, re the guy originally was assigned to that uh, apparently left customs and is working in private practice or something. So I have to dig up who's, who took his place. So anyway, that's how rulings work. Now, both the importer and customs are bound by the ruling. Um, a good practice. If you get a ruling, you ask for a ruling and you get a response, send a copy of the ruling to the CEE. 
don't assume that they see that ruling, that they can look it up uh, or a copy is sent to them. You send a copy, they'll appreciate it that, uh, that you did that. And every time they appreciate something you've done, uh, that puts you in, in a good light and means they're, they're going to think you're a good little importer and they'll go pick on somebody else. Okay, I don't mean, shouldn't say pick on somebody else. They will concentrate their enforcement activities on a different importer. Is that better? Okay. Okay, both the importer and CVP are bound up by the ruling. So if you get a ruling, it's in your favor. It, it reads the way, keep, the results are what you're hoping to get. Then no matter where you import or who or what port you use, uh, that ruling is, is binding on that port and the import specialist involved is binding on the CEE, it's binding on everybody. Okay, so if you get good news, uh, great. Then, it, then that's locked in. Also works in, in, in the other way too. If you get a ruling that doesn't go the way you hoped it would go, uh, you're bound by that. If you get bad news, you're bound by that. Can you ask for reconsider ruling? Yes, you can. However, you can't send them the same old, same old, same old. If you aren't reconsidering a ruling be reconsidered by CVP, you have to give them new evidence, new arguments, new stuff, or else you're going to get the same result. Okay, you publish all the rulings of the cross search engine. In the cross search engine, it's going to name names. If the ruling request came from John Smith at Acme Import Company, it, the ruling request is going to be addressed to your Mr. Smith at Acme Importing Company. So think of that part. And uh, this cross search engine, you can do searches, what they call Boolean search. You can search by keywords. You can search by ruling number. You can search by uh, the product name or number. You can search by tariff number. Um, all kinds of ways you can do the searches. So it's very flexible. It's a good tool. And what sh why you would, you would want to go to the cross search engine, you got a new product, and you're going to be importing a new product and you're wondering, okay, what's the duty rate of this product? Well, maybe one of the first places you go is look in the cross search engine to see if anybody else has imported something similar to your product. How is that classified? And actually with, with clients, what I do is if they are wondering what's the duty classification and duty rate on this thing, um, I'll use the cross search engine. I'll look up for similar items in there. Or if they think that their item is classified under this certain subheading, um, I'll go look up that sub subheading to see what kinds of things fall into that subheading. So a lot of good information there. You can also, there's rulings on whether something is an assist or violates a copyright, all kinds of other stuff is also in the cross search engine. And remember they publish the full text of the ruling, your name, your name, your company's name, and the description of the product. If you think that some of that information should not be disclosed, because remember they're gonna publish the full text there. Then you have to ask for what's called a FOIA exclusion, Freedom of Information Act, FOIA. You have to petition, as part of your ruling request, you say, okay, the following parts of our request are viewed as proprietary information and could cause harm to our business if they're published. So please leave this stuff out. I've had to do that once and I found they were very responsive to that. They even called me and said, okay, Here's the way we're pro proposing to describe your product in a ruling. Is that okay with you? So that's good. Okay, that's ruling uh, process. Something related to tariff classification and duty rates. Um, remember the tariff classification determines the rate of duty and also eligibility for free trade agreements and that kind of stuff. And okay, I'm sorry. That's a, something on my iPhone. And something buzzed and then like told me there's an act a traffic accident two miles from me. I don't need to know that right now. Okay. Some other things, fees and stuff that you have to be concerned with. One is the merchandise processing fee. This is assessed to all formal entries. So if something is subject to a formal entry, remember more than $2,500 in, in value, um, those, those entries are subject to the merchandise processing fee. And I see I made a math error on here, so I'll have to point this out. Okay. Oh, no, okay. The 
merchandise processing fee is 0.3464%. And there's the percentage, 0.003464. So you take the value, the total entered value of the shipment, and you multiply it times 0.003464, and that's the merchandise processing fee. The idea is, behind this fee, is that commercial importers who use custom services to process their entries, they should be paying for the for customs commercial operations. So they took the total budget for cu customs commercial operations and divided it by the total entered value. And that's how they arrived at the merchandise processing fee. And I think I, I made an error. The uh, maximum amount is not $5,128.33 per entry. I think it's 528. The one doesn't belong there, that's a typo. The maximum of $528.33 per entry. And the minimum merchandise price processing fee you can pay is $27.23. So subject to those maximums, minimums, pay a rate 0 0.003464 times the entered value of the shipment. Now, there are a lot of exclusions to merchandise processing fee. The major ones that come to mind is anything classified in chapter 98 of the harmonized tariff. That's like American goods returned and TIBs and that kind of stuff fall in chapter 98, not subject to the MPF. The other major exclusion, most free trade agreements are not subject to the MPF. An example, US MCA with Canada and Mexico, the Korean free trade agreement, the Australian free trade agreement, all these free trade agreements, most of them not subject to the merchandise processing fee. The only ones I can think of right now that are, I think, is the Israeli free trade agreement. And if it is reinstated this year, the generalized system of preferences. Okay, so that's one darn thing you have to worry about when you import things. The other one is the harbor maintenance fee. Harbor maintenance fee is assessed on all ocean imports. So if it comes by ocean and it's imported in any of the US um, seaports that receive international trade, then it's subject to the merchandise processing, I mean, excuse me, the harbor maintenance fee. The idea here behind the harbor maintenance fee is to reimburse the Corps of Engineers, Army Corps of Air Engineers for maintaining the US seaports, like dredging the channels and building breakwaters and doing all that kind of stuff. And so the idea is you're gonna pay for the Army Corps of Engineers to maintain the nation's seaports. So, Ocean freight shipments are subject to it. Very few exclusions. I'll point out one rotten question that was on the customs brokers exam. I think it's been on the customs brokers exam more than once. They said, which of the following imports are not subject to the harbor maintenance fee? And they list like four or five or six different ports of entry. Said, which one is not subject to the harbor maintenance fee? The ports that are subject to the Harbor Maintenance Fee are listed in Part 24 of the Customs Regulations. And there was a, like one small little port uh, that there was on the exam that is not on that list. So it's not subject to the HMF. Hey, terrible question. Anyway, so there is no maximum. You pay one eight, basically one eighth of 1% of the total value of the shipment with no maximum. So if the shipment's worth $10 million, you pay one eighth to one percent of ten million dollars. That's starting to look like a fairly substantial amount of money, and fairly very few exemptions. The only exemptions I can think of is like relief supplies for for emergencies. Okay, so maybe the Red Cross can import stuff, and they don't have to pay the harbor maintenance fee. Other than that, you have to pay it if it comes by ocean. And by by the day, by the way, just a little trivia thing here: the largest port in the United States is. Um, LA Long Beach. How much of this money does LA Long Beach receive through the harbor maintenance fee? The answer is zero. That's the way it works sometimes. Okay. There are a whole lot of other user fees depending on the product. So a lot of products, especially products that follow, they're regulated by the uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration or, or the Department of Agriculture are going to be subject to uh, other user fees. So there is a cotton fee, there's a honey fee, 
um, there's a whole bunch of other fees on top of these fees. So if you're importing honey, uh, first, good luck, because it takes a regular customs duty. Honey from China is subject to dumping duty. And so what some unscrupulous people do is they take Chinese honey, they ship it to a third country and relabel it as the product of that third country, and then ship it to the United States. So what the customs lab does is they get take samples of the honey and they analyze the pollen in it. And if the pollen comes from a plant that's found in China, um, you get a penalty. Anyway, but on top of that, you have to pay a honey fee. So there's a whole lot of, of fees payable, especially on like food and drug regulated products. Let's get into the land of dumping and countervailing duties. Anti-dumping duty, that goes back to the 1930s. And originally was a US thing, US concept. Now what we're seeing is other countries around the world have also adopted dumping and countervailing duties. Okay, dumping duty is assessed for sales at less than fair value that cause injury. There's a there's your description. What the heck does that mean? Okay, a US company makes a product and they have foreign competition. So let's say US company is making television. I don't know if there are any American companies that make televisions anymore. Let's assume there are. American company is making televisions. And a we'll, we'll pick on China on this one. Let's say a Chinese company is also making televisions. And the Chinese company wants to break into the US market. So how do you break into the US market? Well, you sell the uh, TVs at a low price. So people buy them because they are low price. Well, that's good. If you're the consumer of that television, this is good news. Or maybe the Chinese company made too many televisions and they got all this inventory on their hands. And so they need to get rid of the inventory. So how do you get rid of inventory? You reduce the price on it. So it, so it becomes less expensive and people will buy it. And if you're the consumer of that product, once again, good news. That situation is where that name dumping comes from. They're dumping the excess product on the US market. Okay, so these things by themselves, either reducing the price to break into the market or to obtain market share, or getting rid of excess inventory and reducing the price to do that. If you're the consumer of that product, no problem with that, you can buy it at a lower price. So that's by itself is not a bad deal. However, if it causes injury to a competing US industry, the US industry can file a complaint with the US International Trade Commission saying this dumping situation is causing us injury. And uh, they have to explain what injury they're causing. It caused them to lose market share, caused them to lay off workers. Um, those are typical, typical injury situations. Causes them to lose profit. And they have to document and prove all this stuff. The U.S. International Trade Commission will have it investigated by Department of Commerce. And if it comes back saying, yeah, uh, what they said is true, then the International Trade Commission can request the customs assess dumping duties on the product. Some dumping duties are less than 1%. There are other dumping duties like on wood Chinese bedroom furniture, which is like 235%. So it can be disastrous if your product is subject to dumping duty. Countervailing duty, what is that? Well, by the way, the dumping, dumping where companies artificially reduce the price to gain market share, US companies are guilty of the same thing. US companies are also guilty of the fall of countervailing duty. That is where the government of a country uh, provides benefits to, co to companies to export certain products. So a country, maybe wants to help out their television industry um, by providing a uh, benefit to companies that export televisions. And the benefit could be a, a bounty. That is for every television you export, we'll pay you 25 bucks or a tax credit. For every television uh, you export, we'll give you a $10 tax credit or We'll subsidize your production. Uh, it's costing you a lot of make money to make those TVs. Well, we'll give you a subsidy on that. 
that by itself results in a lower price of the product, but it's the same thing. That situation, if it causes injury to a competing U.S. industry, that competing U.S. industry or industry association or labor union can take it to the U.S. International Trade Commission, have it investigated, turns out to be true, they can assess penalties. And dumping duties are equal to the amount that the item has been undervalued. So I, in the example I gave you, the television company reduced the price by $25 to uh, gain market share or whatever the case may be. Well, the dumping duty is gonna be equal to $25 per TV. So it's gonna e equalize things. If the company, if a company exports television receives an export subsidy of $10 per TV, well, the countervailing duty is going to be $10 per TV, in addition to the regular customs duty and MPF and all that kind of stuff. All right. So dumping duties, as said here, can and countervailing duties. Dumping is by far the majority of what you see. Um, by far, the dumping cases outnumber the countervailing duty cases. And so they're all, so the duty rates are all over the place, less than 1%, over 300%, depending on what it is. Um, Every dumping or countervailing duty is assigned a case number. And in the case number, it's going to describe the scope. Here's the products that are subject to this, to this special duty. And they describe them maybe by tariff number. Here's what tariff numbers are subject to this duty. And here's the description of the products. There are products that are made of this stuff and do this and they're sold in the following manner, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Some some of the dumping and countervailing duties are based on manufacturer. So um, let's say um, the dumping duties on manufacturer A in China is 300%. The dumping duty on manufacturer B in China is 100%. Dumping duty on all other manufacturers of that product in China is 400%. So they'll see dumping cases and countervailing duty cases reading by that. And some dumping duties are on a countrywide or industry-wide basis. They could apply to more than one country or they could apply to every manufacturer in that country. So not broken down by manufacturer. Okay, so you see a lot of variety there. And customs for customs, this is a major enforcement area, especially the Government Accounting Office did an audit of customs and they said customs is not collecting all the dumping and countervailing duties that they should be collecting. And there's a lot of companies who are getting away with it. They're using it very shenanigans to get away with not paying them. So they said, you need to tighten up on that. So this is now a major enforcement area for CBP. And so if CBP were to do an audit of an importer, no matter what kind of audit it is, whether it's a quick response audit or a desk audit or a focus assessment audit, intensive audit, doesn't make it, this is, a, issue they're going to be looking for. Okay, and in real life, um, they're also going to be looking for any, the import specialists and the CEEs are going to be looking for situations where maybe the imported goods are subject to dumping duties, but the importer is not paying them. So importers receiving merchandise classified as wood furniture. And the country of origin is China. I bring I use that as a great example of how things work. Well, what customs will then do is, is this wood bedroom furniture or is it other like kitchen furniture or living room furniture, or maybe it's all. So customs actually take a strict approach on there. Um, this is bedroom furniture, unless you can prove otherwise, because bedroom furniture is subject to dumping duty. If it's kitchen furniture, it's not. So they'll take a look at that and the, they'll assume the worst. So that's the situation you deal with. Here's more, hey, more enforcement, just what we need. Now, the Trade Enforcement and Trade Facilitation Act of 2016, I believe it was. Customs now has the authority to investigate initiation, investigation, dumping or do countervailing duty evasion. So if customs either on their own initiative, they detect information indicating that somebody is not paying dumping duties when they should that maybe they're misdescribing the goods. That's a common thing to happen. That maybe they've got wood bedroom furniture from China and they describe it as plastic furniture from China. 
And so they're not paying the dumping duties. Uh, and customers goes and looks at one of the shipments and son of a gun is not made of plastic, made of wood. Okay, they can initiate an investigation into that. How long has this been going on? And what's the extent of the uh, evasion here? Okay, so customs can, or customs can accept rat finks. People can rat on, on, on companies. So maybe a company is uh, importing wood bed bedroom furniture from China and they're paying the dumping duty, which is gonna greatly jack up their prices. And they have a competitor who is also selling wood bedroom furniture made in China. And they also competitors prices are pretty low. So they can go rat on them to uh, customs. Customs even has an 800 number you can call to rat on your competitors, or maybe you got laid off from the company and you're upset now and you can go rat on your own former employer. They encourage that. And they'll actually give you a portion of the money that's recovered. So if, if it results in they're collecting a whole bunch more dumping duty, they'll give you a piece of that action. Okay, so they can get a report from, they can either detect the violation on their own or suspected violation, or another government agency can report it, or a interested party such as a domestic competitor or a former employee or even a current employee can rat on them. Okay, so customs now is one year to either investigate the report or dismiss it. So they may get a report and they look into it and they say, uh, uh, whoever made this report was gr grossly mistaken and there's no violation here. Cool, they dismissed that. I don't know if you're the subject to that viola potential violation where they tell you that, um, but anyway, they can dismiss it or maybe they'll look at it and say, well, maybe they, they forgot to pay some dumping duties, but the amount is minimal. It's not worth our time and time and effort to collect them. So they dismiss it or they'll investigate. And this is what they're more, most likely going to do. They'll send out their own special agents or Homeland Security to investigation to investigate the potential violation, determine did it happen? If it did happen, what's the scope of the violation? And was it negligent was, or was it intentional? And I love this. This is taken out of the uh, Customs um, Federal Register notice announcing all this stuff. And it says, nothing within this part prevents CBP from assessing penalties of any sort related to such cases or taking action under any other relevant laws. That means they can only assess you dumping duties that you didn't pay before, plus interest on the dumping duties. They can assess you a penalty on top of that. So anyway, this is all to discourage that type of behavior. Okay, so let me go to free trade agreements. This is something that a um, little bit nicer news than dumping and countervailing duties. Okay, Customs has like 20 free trade agreements, maybe it's more than 20, there's a lot of them out there. Um, and they're actually pursuing some other ones. They're pursuing a, a free trade agreement in the UK now that's not part of Brexit. So there's other ones maybe in the works. And a lot of them are very, very similar to each other, but they all a little bit different. They're all individual differences. Okay, most free trade agreements result in duty-free entry for eligible products. Um, I think there's a few exceptions, maybe in the Israeli free trade agreement where you may have to pay duty on a, you get a reduced duty rate, but it's not free. But otherwise usually results in duty-free treatment for eligible products. And usually, not always, but usually, the products are also exempt from the merchandise processing fee. Most, but not all classifications will potentially qualify. Well, something like the USMCA with Canada and Mexico, formerly known as NAFTA, all classifications in the tariff qualify. Except maybe chapter 98 doesn't, doesn't qualify, yeah. chapter 99, but chapters one through 97, all eligible. Each FTA has its own rules, rules to qualify. And you have to carefully read those rules. Okay, the best source of information are the general notes in the front of the harmonized tariff schedule. If you go look at the harmonized tariff, whether it's hard copy or soft copy, you'll notice the general notes run several hundred pages. And that's because they go through the free trade agreements one at a time. First, explaining what the rules are, how things qualify. And secondly, they go through the harmonized tariff classifications, explaining what rule applies to this tariff classification. 
Um, some of the free trade agreements, you'll find information in part 10 of the regulations like the Caribbean Basin Initiative is found there. And I think the Israeli free trade agreement is found there. And if it ever gets renewed, generalized system of references is found there. Or part 182 of the regs covers USMCA. So you find other sources of information too. These are all very important. Okay. Let me take you through one using USMCA since it's the most common one, most heavily used one. Let me take you through this one to show you how this one is going to work in real life. You import from Canada or Mexico and you want to take advantage of the USMCA, formerly known as NAFTA. And so the first issue is it, it has to qualify. Well, what qualifies? Well, um, articles grown, mined, or 100% in the US, can Mexico, or Canada. So what you're importing is wheat grown in Saskatchewan, Canada. Well, that qualifies as a 100% Canadian product. Or maybe you're importing silver that's mined and refined into metal in Mexico. Well, that qualifies too. That's a 100% Mexican product. Or you got aluminum casting. The aluminum was mined and made into metal uh, in mined and made into metal in Canada, and was then sent to Mexico, where it was machined into a uh, semi-finished product and then imported in to, into the United States. That's a 100% USMCA product. Cool. For articles meeting the NAFTA rules of our origin, they also qualify. Most things fall under that second bullet. Not many things are grown, mined, or 100% produced in the US, Canada, or Mexico, like lumber or agricultural products, and those kinds of things will qualify, but other than that, or raw materials, they may qualify, but most things are not raw materials, they are manufactured products. Okay, so rules of origin. You've got rules of origin that comply to all other products are either described as tariff shift, regional value content, or combination of both. And that's all determined by the HTS classification. Let me take you through the drill on this. Okay, you're importing a, a let's say electronic analysis device. An electronic analysis device is classified in chapter 90 of the harmonized tariff. So you go look up the eight digit classification, harmonized tariff classification of that product. 90 point something or point something or point something or other. Okay, so you look up the full eight digit tariff classification of that product. Next, you go to general note, I think it's general note 13 now, lucky 13. That has the USMCA rules of origin. You've already determined that product, that analysis machine that's made in Mexico is uses parts and, and materials that are made in Mexico and other countries. Okay, you've already determined that or, you, or that's a safe assumption to make that that analysis machine is made out of parts and materials that come from Mexico and other countries around the world. So now what? Okay, so you classify the harmonized tariff, you go to the general note 13 and look up that tariff classification. And you look up the tariff classification, it'll say either, it'll say one of three things. It'll say a, a change to the, the uh, chapter 90 classification from other headings or from other chapters or something like that. It'll say a change, that's a tariff shift rule. That means that the parts and materials that go into that analysis machine that you cannot prove were made in Mexico, Canada, or the United States. How do you prove them? By either having a certification of origin or a manufacturer's affidavit. If you can't prove that the parts and materials that went into it were made in the US, Canada, or Mexico, all the other parts and materials in it have to undergo the required tariff shift. So if it says those parts and materials must undergo a change in um, tariff classification from other headings to the heading that you're using, well, then all of them have to satisfy that rule um, with the exception. Here's the exception. It's what's called a de minimis rule. So you look at all the parts and materials that go into the product. First, you identify the ones you can prove 
are made in the US, Canada, Mexico. Great, that's fine. Then you go through and take a look at all the ones that undergo the required tariff shift. What's left? If what's left that you can't prove or did not originate is less than 10% of the total value of the product, uh, it still qualifies. So they disregard 10% of the content. That's the de minimis rule for this purpose. Regional value content, what in the heck is that? Okay, that is of the total value of the product, total the value of the product, either 50% or 60% of the total value must be originating. That must means that the materials, parts of materials and the labor content must be equal to 50% or 60%, many, depending which valuation method you're using, must consist of, as I say, originating materials and labor and fabrication costs. So you're gonna need a value breakdown for this one. Okay, there are a few products, primarily like automotive products, where you have to meet both rules. In order to qualify for USMCA, it must, um, undergo a tariff shift and it must meet a regional value content, both. Isn't that cool? That's fortunately, thanks to the new USMCA, there are fewer products that are subject to the combination of the two rules. Once again, all determined by the tariff classification. Um, the best way to learn how USMCA works is to do it. I learned um, NAFTA, um, when I worked for Hughes, we had a sister company that imported the receiver units for direct TV. They made them in Mexico. And they said, we've been claiming NAFTA benefits for these receiver units. Um, can you take a look at them and see, do they actually qualify for NAFTA benefits or are we in trouble? So I went down to the border and they gave me the bills of material. It was a six page bill of material. All the parts and materials that went into the receiver unit in size 10 font and it listed for each item. Here's the part, here's where the part was made. Um, here is what we believe to be the correct tariff classification of this part and such, et cetera. So I had to go through part by part and verify the tariff classification and the country of origin, and all that kind of stuff. And by the time we got done, uh, we found out that it did satisfy the tariff shift rule. And I got back to him and said, you're cool. Um, you can go on claiming NAFTA for it. But in doing so, it was a great learning exercise. And so I'd say, I'd say the same thing to you folks. Take one of your products, get a bill of material, go through the, look up the rule of origin and go through the exercise. The more you do it, the better you're gonna get at it. And can your broker do this for you? Um, your broker, I would say, can help you with that. If they're really good at this and, get me, and they can give you a lot of assistance, your broker is to the Canadian or Mexican border, they're probably gonna have more experience with it. So it can really help you. But otherwise you are responsible, by the way, for determining does it in fact qualify. Okay, for the USMCA, the other free trade agreements, most of the other free trade agreements have the same requirement, same requirement. Under NAFTA, you had the NAFTA certificate of origin. And to prove NAFTA that it qualifies for NAFTA, you had to provide a copy of the certificate of origin. Well, that was that was good. Either the producer or the exporter could give you that certificate and you're good, you're golden. Well, maybe for the most part, you're good. However, under USMCA, they did away with a certificate of origin. Instead, to claim USMCA benefits, you must provide a certification signed by one of three parties, the actual producer of the goods, the manufacturer of the goods, or the exporter of the goods, and the export of the goods better have a backup certification from the manufacturer if they're signing it, um, or by the importer, by you. Okay, one of those three parties have to sign it. Either the producer of the goods or the exporter of the goods, and the exporter is probably gonna rely on something from the producer, or you have to sign it. What's gonna make you comfortable <laughs> with this? Okay, some of the practices, some of the things you may, um, um, put may need to put in place is if you're buying stuff from a supplier in Canada or Mexico in the purchase order, make it a requirement that they provide a certification with the, with the shipping documents. Or if they don't want to do that, that they have to provide you a bill of material 
and a complete value breakdown of the article so that you have enough information to make that determination yourself. Um, and by the way, the certificate of origin must be available at the time of entry. You can't, you don't have two weeks or two months or anything like that. Um, at the time of entry, it's required. If you don't have it, you can produ produce it later. If you don't have it, you can produce it later, but you have to pay duty in MPF in the meantime. Okay, so that's how the, that works. You that's MCA is typical of how they work now. Let me give you one more. This is the Korea Free Trade Agreement, probably maybe the second most commonly used one. When articles qualify for Korea Free Trade Agreement, articles grown, mined, or 100% produced in Korea or the US or combination of Korea and US. So you got a product that made of Korean materials and US labor or US materials and Korean labor. Okay, that's 100%. Not many things are gonna meet that requirement. Or articles made the Korea, you. U.S. Free Trade Agreement Rules of Origin. Where do you find the rules of origin? Chapter 33 of the Harmonized Tariff. And what are those rules of origin? This is gonna sound like something very, very familiar to you. Uh, either the product must meet the tariff shift rule, the value, reason value con content rule, or a combination of both, all determined by the tariff classification. And the importer, the producer, the exporter must provide a certification that the articles meet the rules of origin. And by the way, under USMCA, Canadian and Mexican customs, as well as US customs, have the right to audit those certifications. Okay, so if you're claiming USMCA benefits for articles made in Canada, Canadian customs can actually uh, audit it. So well, prove to us that these things qualify under the USMCA. And if you're importing stuff from Korea and claiming Korea free trade agreement benefits, Korean customs, has the right to audit your claim. And actually the Korean embassy in Los, Angel in Los Angeles has a Korean customs official attached to that consulate, I should say consulate and embassy, attached to that consulate, whose full-time job it is to audit Korea free trade agreement claims. So this has some teeth behind it. Okay, and here's some other stuff. Some of this I already talked about. Most free trade agreements resemble the USMCA. There are a few that don't like the generalized system of preferences or the Korean Basin Initiative uh, or the Israeli free trade agreement they have a little bit different rules, but most of them, US Morocco free trade agreement, the US uh, Jordan free trade agreement, the US Peru free trade agreement, the US Colombia free trade agreement, they all resemble USMCA. So best practices, obviously having resources and training have a plan to obtain certifications or the information you need for certifications. Don't make any automatic claims. Just because a shipment coming is coming is imported from Canada or Mexico, don't automatically claim USMCA benefits. Remember, you gotta have that certification in hand or have a blanket certificate that's good for a year, but the import must happen within that year, okay? And so, before you give instructions to the broker to claim USMCA benefits, verify that you have a certification and that appears to be valid and the articles qualify. Otherwise, don't claim it. Okay, obtain backup information. If you're claiming USMCA benefits or Korea free trade agreement or Australia free trade agreement, you're gonna need bills of material, manufacturing information, support certificates of origin, manufacturer's affidavits, all that stuff you have to have in hand to prove your claim. If you can't prove it, don't take it, okay? And what if you import something from Mexico and you think this qualifies for USMC benefits, but you don't have proof in hand or certification? What you can do is you can pay duty on it. You have one year to obtain a certification and backup evidence that the item qualifies for USMC benefits and you make a claim and ask for your money back. Cheerfully refunded. I don't know if they're cheerful about it, but they'll refund your money anyway. So there is a mechanism to get your money back. And by the way, all the certifications, the importer keeps the certification on hand. Customs can ask for it, ask to see it, but customs doesn't want your certification. You keep it on hand for up to five years. All supporting records, keep them for five years. Customs has five years to ask for evidence that the item qualifies under the free trade agreement. This is all free trade agreements, same rule applies. Special duties. I'm looking at my clock. 
and Mickey's hand is on the 12. I think, I think we're finished for today because this is going to run several, oh, this runs several more pages. So we're going to finish the subject for today. Next, tomorrow, same time, same station. We're going to take up where we left off with special duties, the 301 and the 232 duties. Then we're going to customs valuation. And then we're going to go into mechanisms for avoiding paying duties. And then we're going to take a walk on the wild, on the dark side for penalties and other agency requirements and all that kind of all that stuff so anyway there's all that so turn tune in tomorrow same time same station that's it for today your excuse go off and enjoy the rest of the day thank you thank you so much bruce i want to appreciate all your uh, your um, information you've shared today and again thank you all who've joined we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow have a pleasant afternoon thanks, thanks. to Anna at the fta for helping out thank you thank you